Recording in progress. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Councillor Eva Lloyd and I am the Chair of the Council. Can I welcome everyone to today's meeting, which is a multi-location meeting. The meeting will be live streamed and recorded and will be available for viewing after the meeting. Should the live streaming fail, the meeting will continue and a recording will be available through the Council's website following the conclusion of the meeting. Can I remind members that translation facilities are available and for those attending remotely to choose your language of choice. For those wishing to speak in the chamber, please raise your hand. For those attending remotely, please use the raise hand function. We will alternate between speakers in the chamber and remote attendees. For those attending remotely, please note that those in the chamber will be unable to use the chat facility. Committee members who are attending remotely are required to leave the camera on throughout the debate and when voting in order to maintain the integrity of the decision-making process. If you do need to leave the meeting temporarily, please put a message in the chat function so the Democratic Services Officer is aware and then let us know when you return. I expect everyone present and participating in this meeting to conduct themselves appropriately and be respectful to each other. That applies to members, officers and anyone in the public gallery. Moving on to the agenda. Item 1. Apologies for absence. Please, Sally. Thank you. Councillors Ros Griffiths Williams, Keith Eels, Angie O'Grady, and Neil Coverley. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Can I just remind members that you must declare the nature of your declared personal interest? Matt? Not uh, related to members' interests, Chair, but uh, rather officers, just in terms of item eight, currently on the agenda, paper policy for the year 24 25. Um, I, I would suggest that heads of service, uh, strategic directors and the chief executive uh, should leave the meeting during the debate and the vote on that item, uh, given that it, it relates this specific information relating to clearly identifiable posts there. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, and um, rather than we go around all the different heads of service and strategic directors and myself, I'll declare on behalf of all, all the relevant officers on that item that we'll leave. Um, there will be officers here to respond to any questions, so we'll have the deputy monitoring officer and a senior HR officer here to, to respond to any, any inquiries. Thank you. And to ease the process, I think I'm going to move this item or that item to the end of the agenda. I think that's... Uh, yeah, OK. Hello? Item three, matter on Item three, urgent matters. Anything? No, nothing. Minutes of the council. To approve as a correct record the minutes of the council held on the 25th of January. Anything? Any matters arising? No. No. So, can I have someone to propose? Thank you. Councillor um, Owen. Owen. Uh, and somebody to second. Councillor Tristan. And show of hands, please. Thank you very much. Uh, well. Announcements. Well, I will now change to English. Just to remind you that tomorrow is our patron saint. Um, do not do Sands, St. David's Day. And if we are fortunate enough to finish today's uh, meeting in good time, uh, then in advance of Friday celebrations, we have the Maltron Choir from Canal Von Mal performing for staff and the public at Coipetha at 1 p.m. 
So if I talk quicker, um, we might get there. Uh, a treat not to be missed, uh, I'm sure. Um, just to go back in time a bit, in January, I had the opportunity to go back to the town hall uh, in Lloyd Street in Llandidno. During this time, I had the honour of welcoming eight new British citizens alongside Kate Hill Trevor, the High Sheriff of Cloyd, and special guest, Chris Cater, who welcomed his South African relative into our community. It was truly a special occasion for everyone uh, involved. Uh, as mentioned in our previous meeting, I attended the Holocaust Memorial event in the St. George's Hotel on Sunday the 28th of January, together with the leader. This event served as a remembrance of the Holocaust Memorial Day, which took place on uh, January the 26th during Holocaust Memorial Week. I must say it was an absolute privilege to meet the Holocaust historians and to listen to the powerful stories that evening. I would like to express my gratitude to the Holocaust Educational Trust for their efforts in ensuring that millions of people who lost their lives in the Holocaust, as well as in other genocides, are never forgotten. Uh, a date has been selected uh, for my Chairman's Charity Challenge. Try saying that with uh, a mouthful of crisps. Uh, I will be doing the North Wales Zip, uh, Zip World Challenge in aid of the charity Mind Conway in the company of the leader, who will be raising awareness and raising money for his chosen cha charity, uh, Cry. We also hopefully will have some esteemed guests in tow. Um, I hope you will all be supportive of these very worthwhile causes and information on how to contribute will be distributed uh, to you forthwith. And the date, well, the 4th of May, or as it will now be known, Star Wars Day. Why? Simply, may the 4th be with you. Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our dedicated officers and members for their hard work and commitment through the budget setting process. This has been a time consuming and arduous task, and I truly appreciate their efforts. Let us all acknowledge the long and winding journey we have had to take to reach this point here today, where we can finalize a balanced budget. I would like to emphasize again uh, our former Strategic Director of Finances, uh, Strapline, that members should be reminded that setting the budget is a process and not an event. I hand over now to the leader. A few uh, no announcements for me at this stage. I'm sure members will be tired of my dulcet tones by the end of today's meeting, Chair. Uh, any members of Cabinet would like to speak? Kungharith Julie. Um, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to share with members, um, we had a jobs expo last week. Um, it was an all sectors uh, careers and jobs fair, which we held at um, ADS event centre in Colwyn Bay. And it was organised by our um, Conway Employment Hub um, and in collaboration with the Department for Work and Pensions and Work in Wales. Uh, it included a mixture of exhibitors from businesses and organisations uh, that were recruiting uh, or had placements, apprenticeships and volunteer roles. Um, and we also had over 100 live vacancies there on the day. Um, we had 86 employers attend and 1,117 people attended in the four four hour period. So really successful. Um, and I, I just want to uh, say thank you to the team that pulled that together. You know, it's so important that our young people have opportunity to see what what lays ahead and and what opportunities there are for them. So um, yeah, massive thanks to the to the team and and obviously the other bodies that helped to make that day so successful. Yeah, that's an amazing effort. Uh, thanks to everyone involved. Runa Rathor Cabinet. Anyone else from the anybody else from the cabinet? No, Wesley. I will hand you over to the chief exec. Uh, I'll be doing the husband in Welsh, so if you could put your headsets on. Before. Um, just one thing from me today, just welcome to Katie Club, who's sitting in the back. I'm sure she won't be happy me saying this, but uh, welcome Katie, who started as the strategic housing head since Monday. So it's been quite a busy week for Katie and what's going on at the moment here as well. It's challenge, very challenging, but I'm sure I'm talking for everybody here, welcoming Katie to the council and looking forward to working with, with her as we move on with the 
Huge challenges in front of us with housing. Thank you. Welcome, Katie, from everybody. So moving on to item six. Any questions under council procedure rule 4.14.2? No, nothing. Thank you very much. So moving on to item seven. And I'm the petition has come before me. So I'll read out an e petition and could just go in. Okay, my on it. Right. I had an e petition presented to myself and was asked if I would present it. Um, I will. Um, and I will explain to you, it is from a lady called Helen Catherine Wilson. It was an e-petition, and the title is Stop Cuts to Economy Schools for the Financial Year 2024-25. It has reached 1,396 um, signatures. Uh, I might as well go into some detail of the description of this petition. Um, Conway schools are in such a poor financial position that head teachers have written to all parents and carers cle clearly outlining the negative impact further budget cuts imposed by the council with, will have on our local schools and the staff within them. Knowing the current state of our local schools and pressures they already face, this is of deep concern. I propose the council set aside cuts for schools this coming financial year in order to consult properly with parents and carers to their long-term plan for schools in the area. I'd like to hand this over to Matt to address um, because there is a certain procedure involved. Yeah. Well, Chair, now it's for you to read and receive the petition and then there will be uh, within 15 working days, a response to the lead petitioner and also published on the council's website. So I can't discuss any further because of that is due process. So I'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item eight, which we have deferred. So we'll skip that and we'll go to item nine. So I submit the line and so we'll move on back to the Welsh. Item nine is the minimum revenue provision policy for 2024-2025. And I believe it's Councillor Charlie McCubri who's going to be taking this item. Thank you. Um Dilk Dareth. Um so this is quite a technical report, members. Um where a local authority funds capital expenditure by debt, it's a requirement that it sets aside resources each year to repay the debt through charge the revenue account, that is the minimum revenue provision. So it's a regular requirement that the council in advance of each year approves an MRP policy, which is in line with the guidance issued by Welsh Government. So essentially, where we borrow money to carry out capital schemes, we have to ensure that we've got sufficient finances to pay it back. Um, Appendix A, there are a number of options away we can calculate that. The advice from our officers, um, the, the options recommended are the most for our officers. They are as follows. To approve the minimum revenue provision policy as set in paragraph 3.5 in Appendix A, right of use assets, formerly finance and operating leases, MRP charge is equal to the element of the rent charge that goes to write down the balance sheet liability, except for the high value, long life right of use assets. All other assets, including PFI assets and high value long life right of use assets, adoption of option three, asset life method. MRP will commence in a year following the one in which the asset becomes operational. Investment properties will be regarded as becoming operational when they begin to generate revenues, as well industrial units and plots for economic regeneration categorized as property, plant, and equipment, but with similar characteristics to investment properties. Um, so I'd, I'd like to proceed by moving those recommendations, Chair. Thank you. I have a proposer. Do I have a seconder? I have a seconder in Councillor Abdul. Anybody, any comments or any questions? Any comments? No. Councillor Mike. 
So we'll move to the votes. So, so prove that minimum revenue policy are set out in paragraph 3.5 and the reports. Everybody for. And anybody against? Anybody abstaining? No, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much. So moving on to item 10, the capital strategy and the treasury management strategy for 2024-2025. And once again, Councillor Charlie McCubrey, the leader, will be taking this item and the portfolio holder as well. Okay. Uh, thank you once again, Chair. Again, it is quite a technical report. Um, it brings forward the elements of reporting requirements for Treasury managers that need the following approval, the capital strategy, the Treasury management strategy, and the vestment strategy. So essentially, we as a council handle quite large sums of money. We have um, money that we've borrowed. Clearly, we want to make sure that that's borrowed at the best possible rates. We have short-term cash fluctuations where we can invest money. And again, it's about making sure that's invested sensibly and wisely and takes a balance of risk uh, and that we comply with the appropriate Welsh government guidelines. Um, this has been to scrut audit and scrutiny, Chair, uh, and basically I'll move straight to the recommendations on 2.2. The Council approves the following strategies, the capital strategy, present management strategy, potential indicators, and the investment strategy. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I have a proposer. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Gronwy, thank you very much. Do I have any, any questions, any comments from from this? No? So I will go straight to the votes, to the recommendation that the Council approves the following strategies, the capital strategy, treasury, ma treasury management strategy and prudential indicators, and the investment strategy. Everybody for? Thank you. Anybody against? And anybody abstaining? No? Okay, that's been carried as well. Thank you. We're on fire this morning, guys. And moving on to item 11, proposed capital programme for 2024-2025. Again, it's the councillor, Charlie McCubrey, the, the leader and portfolio holder. Thanks once again, Chair. So, members will be aware, as part of our capital alloc uh, allocation of funding from Welsh Government, we receive an element of capital uh, funding. Um, it's a total of around um, £6.899 million. Pounds. So, the key thing here is anything that we do above that, um, we have to borrow, and, and that creates pressures on our revenue. So, there's a real balance there between... Um, carrying out essential works like our flood defences, um, replacing sort of defunct machinery, um, our, our vendor mappings and things like that, but being really aware of the pressures that puts in our revenue budgets moving forward. And it's especially important now, given that inter interest rates, um, whilst we hope they will fall, remain stubbornly high. So th there is a balance to be found there. Um, another factor we have to remember as well is that often there are substantial grants we can access to the benefit of residents but that requires an element of um, capital being put into the uh, into the system essentially so we have a very robust procedure um, the capital business cases um, are scrutinized um, by members in a budget working group they're scored on four different criteria um, but then we have to really look and talk about are these absolutely essential what will be the implications if we don't do them uh, some of these, it's it's very obvious, like our flood defences, we know we don't carry out those works. We may miss out on the 85% of funding that Welsh Government puts in, and obviously those properties are exposed and at risk. So it is a balancing act. Um, it, it it fluctuates um, now and then. You will see there's some minor changes there in terms of things that have happened um, since we last looked at this report. Um, but overall, I'm confident that this is the right balance between providing the essential capital cases that we need, but being uh, really mindful of the impact on our revenue budget, which obviously we'll be discussing in the next part of the meeting, Chair. So 
With that in mind, I'm sure members will have questions about this one, but I will move option 5.1, which is for members to support the proposed capital programme for 24-25. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a poser. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dillwyn, thank you very much. Any comments or questions from this? Councillor Gareth, thank you. In view of the fact that you know there seems to be a drive now towards getting collaboration between councils, is it an opportune time to actually look at some of the big spends that we've got in the bulking stations and the rate waste transfer stations and things like that? And anything really that we could work with other councils um, to look at, you know, afresh, at could we actually combine our resources together before we embark on some really long term commitments for Conway Council, which will affect revenue for years to come? Um, I understand the needs to push push ahead with a lot of these schemes and things like that, but maybe there's an opportunity now to look at everything afresh um, and collaborate with other councils. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is an opportunity with CJCs. Yeah, I think in the future, but I'll, I'll hand over to Councillor. Yeah, Chairman. I think, Gareth, you know, we have to look at every option. I know long before my time, I became a councillor, there were discussions about um, uh, you know, bringing councils together. But I think we are in a situation now where we have to unturn every stone. Um, the Chief Executive and I have had meetings with the Chief Executive of Denbyshire and the Leader. We've got another one scheduled tomorrow to look at areas where we can work together, to look at areas where we can increase our resistance. You'll be aware many of our services, a very no small number of officers, that there's resilience issues there if people are ill or on the maternity leave. So I absolutely think we can look to explore options that we absolutely have to. Um, CJCs are in their infancy, but again, is there an opportunity there to look at pulling services like procurement and, and drive costs down? You know, we, we, we absolutely have to do that. But you, you, you will see in the appendix, you know, what these are for. I think they are essential at this moment in time, but I think you make a really valid and fair point and something I'm really keen to look into and pursue. So thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Gareth. Anything else? Councillor Andrew. Councillor Andrew. Uh, just, uh, Charlie, just uh, a quick one. Just put the microphone a bit closer. I lost get some of the words in. Um, I'd just like to echo what Gareth just said about the uh, working between councils to save money. Um, we need to look at this more closely. He did mention something that was close to my heart, the waste transfer station, which if we go ahead with it, it's going to cost a lot more for Conway to run as a separate entity to Denby. So, we really need to look at this and drill it down. It's it's a very important thing. So I, I welcome Gareth's words and, um, and hopefully an undertaking from the leader and officers that they will look at this as a cost saving for, as Gareth put it, major revenue costs for many years, 20 to 40 years. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Andrew. Uh, Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Tom. Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to have to give it a bit of a background here for some members that uh, weren't in economy in place a couple of months ago. Uh, on page 100 in the pack, uh, business case 34, uh, there's a capital business case there being proposed for £800,000 to make adaptations to public homes. Uh, the policy came before economy in place two months ago. The Welsh Government was insisting that Conway remove its means testing for the grants that we give out to adapt homes uh, to allow res residents to, to, to stay in their homes. Uh, during that debate, I mentioned that I was concerned that that report and the policy had no reference to how this authority works with RSLs in the county to ensure that RSLs are not making use of this money in instead of doing the works themselves, because RSLs were born out of county councils like this, handing over tens of millions of pounds worth of land and homes to create RSLs. And they have a duty, in my mind, to ensure that if if one of their tenants has a need for an adaption to, to their homes, that that they make those that they make that home right, basically. And I'm I'm concerned that with RSLs like ourselves facing 
budgetary issues that they may encourage or push their tenants towards applying for this grant instead of finding that resource themselves. Uh, and since and since I raised those points uh, in economy in place, this item has now come forward and I can't see any adaption to the policy there. So I'm concerned that this £800,000 is actually just going to end up being a subsidy for RSLs to make adaptions to homes that they own. And this authority doesn't get to keep those homes. It does. It doesn't get to keep the rental from 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 those homes. But actually, we're going to potentially give eight hundred thousand pounds for them to make adaptions there. I think we need to have this money available to support people stay in their homes. But I think we need to safeguard ourselves as an authority to make sure that we're not just creating a line of income for RSLs and other large public housing so associations to use to make adaptions to their homes when in my view they should be footing that bill thanks chair you can take fair enough so we should, so, so any we... any comments no and uh, councillor paul an officer may be out uh, excuse me uh, uh, paul sorry councillor on Sorry, Councillor Arron. Uh, and apologies that I can't join you uh, in person this morning. Uh, just on Councillor Tom's point, uh, he's absolutely right. This pot of money is important to keep people um, living in their, uh, independently in their homes. Um, I suggest maybe, uh, as Katie has started with us as new head of housing, that maybe we get together, Councillor Tom, uh, sometime after this meeting um, and discuss this further. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Seems like a lot of way forward. Councillor Paul. Yeah. My best understanding, unless an officer tells me otherwise, is that RSLs get a specific Welsh Government grant. Jack, can you move the microphone, please, Paul? Uh, to go um, towards uh, they, them as an RSL, a housing association, to do aid and adaptations. So my understanding is uh, if, if you want an aid or an adaptation or, or some change in your RSL house as a tenant, you, you apply for that to the RSL and Welsh government give each year to each RSL a sum of money to facilitate that. That's my understanding, unless an officer here tells me that's nonsense. Bring in Dio. Yeah, uh, yeah that, thank you, Dio. Um, I think the suggestion from Councillor Aaron, I think, is the sensible way forward in terms of uh, we're going into the minutiae and the, and the technical elements of this. And while it's a very valid point, I'm not questioning that at all. But given that the, the item before us is the proposed capital programme, the spending of that capital programme and making sure that we make the best of that money is clearly something that we should be working on. And we will have that discussion um, at an officer level um, with the relevant um, councillors um, moving forward. I think I think it's a, it's a, it is a very fair point to make. I can't respond to that point, Councillor Paul. I don't have the information, but but clearly uh, others may have. But that might be a discussion for outside this meeting. Let's come back, Tom. Yes, thank you. And I look forward to having that meeting as well, I guess. My my concern more was that I raised this in the economy in place sev several months ago, and now it's come before us, and we're asking to vote for something. When in my mind, there's quite a big element of uncertainty hanging over that eight hundred thousand pound. Okay, it's now been brought up here, and we're going to have that meeting and hopefully come up with a way to 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 safeguard us for next year. But we're still looking at spending eight hundred thousand pound this year when we don't know necessarily that, that that those safeguards are in place. So I thank uh, Aaron for saying that he'll meet with me. I, I do look forward to that. And I know that on this issue, me and Aaron tend to align quite well. So I'm sure we'll get somewhere there. But I'm just concerned that I raised this two months ago and now we're here and looking to spend the best part of a million pound and we still don't have the answers to make sure that that money is going to the best causes, not just subsidising RSLs. And uh, my understanding is pretty similar to Councillor Paul's, but my point, uh, Paul, was more that in our policy, there is no safeguard to make sure that we check that that tenant has been through that process first. So I'm not suggesting that RSLs are doing this, but there 
in my mind, there is no, there is nothing that stops them pushing tenants towards ourselves before they go through that 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 process in in internally. So that's more what my concern is. Is great that we're going to do something about it, but we're still looking at spending the best part of a million pound now without having that 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 safeguard in place. But thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm going to bring in the strategic director for finance. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Councillor Tom. Um, um, I, I can't say with absolute definitiveness uh, today that, that it doesn't involve uh, spend in relation to um, uh, public sector housing, but it, looking at the detail of the business case, it does reference actually it's about uh, ad adaptations for privately owned uh, property rather than public housing. I appreciate the title set does say public housing, so that's obviously uh, um, a, a confusing point, but the, the detail of the business case references that the adaptations are for privately owned housing, but I, I guess the point being is that in, in, in future Future discussions in the discussions going forward, uh, we we can sort those anomalies out. But I'm I'm uh, I'm fairly confident uh, that the money is for private private adaptations, not for public adaptations, and therefore uh, it, it wouldn't be a subsidy to RSLs uh, inadvertently. Therefore, Councillor Anne. Thanks, Chair. Um, my my question to Charlie is is, is about, about page one hundred and its business case twenty two, which is about playground maintenance. I mean, I've had quite a number of meetings with our our playground team in Pemmamar about the, the state of various playgrounds in the ward, and I think we've got seven of them. Um, here, the the team playground team have actually asked for one point six million in terms of capital funding, so that they can maintain our playgrounds, and and clearly we are um, saying we're we're prepared to award zero to them to do this work. My understanding is without this work, that if any member if any piece of equipment uh, fails, it will automatically be withdrawn because there will be no money to either repair it or to replace it. Now, I think the sort of comments uh, section here says the mitigation is that there's an expectation or a likelihood that there will be grant funding to, to the council and indeed to town and community councils. Now, I think I am aware that there is some UK SP, uh, SPF funding, but it's like a tenth of what the playground team have asked for. And I'm not aware that, that our 34 town and community councils have got any funding application. So can Charlie just clarify what the impact of this decision will be? Um, I can't give the full, full detail, but I'm aware that there have been quite a few shared prosperity um, grants gone in. Some of them are about playgrounds, some of them about repairs to muggers, some of them are replacing specific items in specific parks. Um, clearly, um, we would all love to have £1.6 million in for our playgrounds, but the, the budgetary situation is that there are many business cases that we've not been able to support. We have tried where we can with the limited funds of the shared prosperity fund to mitigate against that. Um, but that they are valid concerns that you raise. And um, as a council, we will always do all we can to ensure that these facilities are in the best possible condition. But there, there isn't an endless sum of money, um, as will be discussed in the upcoming item. But um, thank you for your question. So just to, just to sort of come back on that, um, Charlie, what you're saying is there for only the three wards that the the 160k UK SPF fund will actually have their playgrounds maintained this year. Is that is that what you're saying? Like no, that, that's not what I'm saying. To be clear, I I don't have the full detail of of the different projects. There were some of them that were county based, on. there were some of them that were specific. There were some were from town councils and community councils. Um, my understanding is that those are going to be published fairly soon uh, i'll be quite happy to, to, to look and get you the detail but uh, I, I i you know i couldn't categorically say what the amounts are at this moment in time i think they've already been published charlie thanks the yeah, council Anne. council louise um uh, uh i'm going to have my mind through kenny uh doing them all, and, sorry and not... i'm can't be present today and not have... i apologize uh, apology. uh um, I'm in London. Um, okay, um, me, me I will be speaking English now. Sorry, council was breaking up. Um, so, just sort of leading on from what Anne was saying about the shared prosperity list, just checking that that is public before I carry on. Am I allowed to discuss a couple of things on that, please? I'll ask authority on this one. 
Is it in the public domain? Is the question? I don't know if it is or not. We're not quite sure yet. Um, okay, so we've been sent the list as councillors. Okay. Yeah, one second. Yeah. So video. No. Okay. In truth, um, we haven't had that confirmed whether it's be in the public domain or not, uh, Louise. So, on the back of that, it's it's safer not to discuss in the open forum. Okay, I can't say anything then. <laughs> Sorry. My point was about that. Okay, fine. I do apologise. Uh, we. Don't have any other. Yes, we do, Councillor. Yeah, um, and can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm just concerned that uh, some of the budget lines that have been struck out are, are zero. Uh, some significant items uh, like traffic level, cr um, traffic signal maintenance, and things. And um, what kind of risk have we got of? Uh, unplanned emergency expenditure in the year and the i also just note the state of the of our capital finances that uh, we're forced to be have, have to borrow the two million pound allocated for highway refurbishment and pothole refer, repair uh, it's a dire state of affairs can i bring one of the cabinet members in for erf please Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. The okay, Simon, can you ask the question again, please? It's not really a question. It's just saying the observation that we're having to borrow two million pounds for highway refurbishment, um, such as the state of our capital uh, fund at the moment. Well, yeah, I can totally agree. That we are in a in a situation where many of our services are under extreme pressure due to financial restraints on budgets of the authority. Yes, I agree. Sorry, we've just had a news flash. The um, Council Owen has informed me that the SPF is live since Tuesday. Yeah. Yes, we, we had an email on, on Monday saying that they were going live on Tuesday, on Tuesday. the 27th. No. I missed that. Okay, they are public. So, should we go back to Council Louise? I think that's yeah. only fair. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, Dioch. Um, so it was just looking at the shared prosperity uh, awards that have been granted. Um, there's quite a lot that have gone to ourselves, like we've marked our own homework and given ourselves some money. And I was just a little bit concerned what came first, chicken and egg. So as we're looking through this capital programme um, and we're deciding not to fund playgrounds, and I, and I get the bigger picture, but then obviously we've got a shared prosperity grant to fund playgrounds and similar um there's a lot of information in that it's not very clear as to whether grants are capital or revenue so i've got two questions is are we going to get a bit more information about where the money's going for our projects that, where we've won the bids for example there's one called leisure pathway to pride and place no idea whether that's a revenue base as a council uh, representing conway i'd like to know more information about our own grants and then secondly um, is, did you know this was coming? Essentially, you've kind of what I'm trying to say is, is that you you know there's no you can't fund everything that we'd like to fund, but you kind of knew that there was a shared prosperity grant, and you said right, we'll we'll then see if we can get some out of that fund to backfill the capital monies that we don't have, and I'm not sure that was the purpose of the shared prosperity grant to backfill um, council coffers, but just your thoughts on. Did you know that you were going to use Shared Prosperity Fund to fill some of these gaps? Councillor Charlie. Um, thanks, Louise. So a couple of things. You know, the Shared Prosperity Fund was very clear. It talked about pride in place and communities uh, and making a better environment for our, our residents to live in. Um, 
it, the criteria are very clear. Any application has to meet those funding criteria. It goes to a panel. The panel is, is elected members, officers, representative from CVSC and a representative from uh, the small business. The the very first meeting, you know, we, we you know, I, I admit we're slightly nervous about who should be delivering it. Should it be us or the private sector? And, and they were very clear with a lot of the projects. Actually, Conway is best placed to deliver these projects. You know, if we have the resources, we can do lots of good things. We had a very balanced approach. I think it was off the top of my head, it was around 50-50 in terms of projects in the community and projects that we can deliver. So there are criteria to meet. There was a panel. Uh, from memory, every single decision has been unanimous. There's been there's been no issues with people uh, debating who should do it, who shouldn't do it. You'll be aware that it's a condition of that grant that it has to be spent by December 24. So there's some really tight deadlines that we've got there. And again, it's who's best placed to actually bring that project forward. Now, I have issues with the park in my ward. I, I don't care if it's a private contractor or the council that does it, nor am I resident. So I think we have used that funding appropriately. I think we've used it in line with what it was designed for, which is to try and improve the environment and, and the facilities for our residents. And I think it did recognise the difficulties councils have had in, in looking after those non-statutory functions. So it's coming to scrutiny, I believe, in May, a full report on what they all are and what they all entail. Um, so I'm sure you'll have a lot more information then about what the actual individual projects mean and how it can benefit your own particular residents. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Louise, is that? Yeah. Right, I'm going to come to the vote. I think we've come to that point. So, the proposed capital programme, we've had the proposer and we have a seconder. Sorry, Councillor Tom. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, thanks for letting me come back in. It was just uh, a quick one, really, and apologies if this isn't the right time to bring this up, but I just wanted a bit of information really from the leader or the cabinet, whoever can answer it for me, basically, is that uh, I, if I cast my memory back, I remember that we uh, this council approved uh, taking out a loan to support the SPF funding for Slamvervecken and Slamroos car parks to be repaved. I was told uh, recently that Slamroos Town Council has offered to grant the gap uh, in cost for the Slamroos car park to be repaved. Uh, if, me if memory serves, it was around £12,000. Slamroos Town Council has offered to pay that difference to keep the Slamroos car park um, free to use. And I just wondered if there was an update on that because I'm conscious, and again, forgive me if this is the wrong time to bring this up, but I'm conscious of this authority taking on debt, which we will then have to finance next year, which will only apply additional pressure to our finances next year. If we can lower bor lower the amount of money that we're borrowing this year, it'll save us next year. So I just wanted an update, really. Um, sorry, again, if this is the wrong time to bring this up, but thanks, Chair. Point of clarity now, we're talking about the Watling Street car park. In yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I think Geraint in? Doesn't okay, Councillor Aaron. Uh, yeah, um, just to um, respond to Councillor Tom, um, yeah, this uh, uh Councillor Nee and I met with um, Llanus Town Council last night. Um, discussions are still ongoing, uh, and hopefully, officers will be meeting with the Town Council uh, in the coming weeks. So, yeah, discussions are still ongoing. Yeah, well. Tom. Yes, okay. I, again, I'm just concerned about us taking out a loan if we could possibly get a grant to pay for the works down in Flamroos. My understanding was that the town council offered this at the end of last year. So, but okay, if, if, if we don't know the outcome just now, that's fine. But I'm just a little concerned about us possibly signing off a budget which has a loan in it when actually we could potentially use a grant for that. But okay, thank you. I'll bring in the chief executive to... Uh... Just as a point of clarity, the loan will not be drawn down until the time is to to take to do the work. So, so if there are alternative arrangements in the interim, those will come into play, and therefore the loan will be less. One thing, um, you know, and and also that decision has already been made, so it doesn't form part of this this decision. So, so I guess any questions around this should be addressed at another meeting, I guess, rather than this item. Thank you. Great. Right. 
wedi pawb, wedi... Has everybody, is everybody happy? Right, so we'll go to the vote. As we have a proposer and we have a seconder. So the proposal is for the capital program 2024-25. Everyone in favour, please. And those against? Okay, and anyone want to abstain? No, that one's carried. Thank you very much. Chair, yeah, can and we have the actual results, please? I will ask our monitoring officer. Yeah, there were eight against the rest in favour. Thanks, well, Chair. Thank you. In problem. Okay, now we go on to item 12 on your agenda. Uh, the recommended budget, 2024, Council Tax and Associated Resolution. Again, the leader, Charlie McCubrey. Councillor Abdul. Before the leader comes to present, uh, as a members, we also have dual heart. We live in as a residence. And so can we as a collectively declare interest? We do have interest here and we... Decided that budget. We are, you know, as a as a residence, we haven't taken it lightly. So I um, just want to clarify with the monitoring officer if we can declare interest of ourselves as well on that. Chair, if I could just ask to to, to repeat what the concern is, if you don't mind, Councillor Abdul. Well, as a, as well as a councillor, I'm a resident of this council, and we also pay the rates. So can we? Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't arise because it, 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 there's a provision within the code of conduct where it, it, it essentially it, it affects the majority of the residents in the area. So there the doesn't need to be a declaration in those circumstances. That's my concern. If can, that can be noted anyway. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, over to the leader, Councillor Shelley. Um, Joel Kader. Andrew, can I just check that you can hear me okay online? Yes, fine. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, members. Um, so my immediate pre predecessor in this role, Sam Rowlands, uh, who had the common sense to leave and join the Senate a few years ago, said to me once that the most important role of elected members was to set a budget that allows our officers to provide the services that our residents want. So that's a difficult job in the best of times, and these are clearly not the best of times. As elected members, we all stood to try and benefit our residents' lives. And it's deeply disappointing to once again be in a position where this budget is essentially about balancing further damaging cuts to services and another welcome increase in council tax. So clearly, you will see in the news every day, this situation is not unique to Conway. It's very clear that throughout the country that the work councils do is undervalued and underfunded. It is councils that have borne the brunt of 14 years of austerity. This is all the more disappointing at a time when taxation rates are the highest since they've been since the Second World War. Put simply, we're all paying more money to the Treasury and less and less is coming back to councils to provide vital services that people rely on from cradle to grave. So I think this is fundamentally wrong. I think it's incredibly short-sighted. We can all see that despite the heroic efforts of our colleagues that work in the health service that the NHS is under, severe pressure. Many of the services that we provide directly support the NHS. Last year, this council provided 456,000 hours of domiciliary care, keeping people in their houses and out of hospital. But I would make the case that virtually every service that we provide directly impacts on people's health and well-being. Educating our children, supporting those with additional learning needs to reach their, fo reach their full potential. Our leisure centres keeping people fit and healthy. 10% of the NHS spend currently is on type 2 diabetes. 80% of that money is spent on the complications of type 2 diabetes. That is a huge concern moving forward. We have our libraries and our cultural and heritage assets, our environment and our green spaces. The vitally important work that our economic development teams carry out supporting our local businesses. And we've seen during COVID, you know, we administered 70 million pounds of grants to keep those businesses going and they were incredibly efficient. 
you know, it was councils who bore the brunt of the uh, responsibilities during COVID. Our social workers look after our most vulnerable, and we've got our housing team here dealing with a huge increase in the numbers of people presenting as homelessness, homeless, sorry, as a direct result of the current cost of living crisis. So it's abundantly clear to me that the continued erosion of our ability to provide these services will have a long-term detrimental effect and ultimately it'll be more expensive on the already overstretched public purse. So in terms of the services we provide, councils are essentially law takers, not law lawmakers. Laws are made either by a UK government or the Senate. And the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accounts is the estimated that local government have around 2,000 statutory duties that we have to fulfil. Somewhat unhelpfully, many of these are not well defined in terms of the level of service that we have to offer, but for the most critical, we've clear legal guidelines that we have to follow. So that obviously greatly adds to the complexity. Setting a balanced budget, people will often refer to our inability to manage our budget, but quite simply, we legally can't turn people away. If more people become homeless or more vulnerable children need our care, then we're legally obliged to provide those services within our existing budgets or find it from our reserves. So, and I want to look at the specific reasons behind the budget challenges that we face. Um, if members can go to page 116, um, it's uh, table two. Okay, so table two sets out some of the challenges we face and the reasons why we have a shortfall. Um, if we look at the first one, pay pressures, teaching staff, schools and non-schools and youth workers. So in the next year, that'll be an additional £6.3 million. Uh, it's important to note that we don't set teachers' pay. It, Welsh Government sets that pay. In the next column, we have £6,480,000 for our own staff pay. So already there, there's £12.7 million just to pay our staff and our teaching staff. There is a note at the bottom there, there's another risk. There's a £2 million um, pension contribution to schools. Again, we don't set those figures. Um, we are hopeful that this will be um, given to us as a grant, but clearly there's some uncertainty around that. Pay pressures for elected members. There's 100K there to fund increase in our allowances. Again, it's important for me to re-emphasise that this is set independently. Clearly members can do what they want with that if they decide to take it or not. But... It's important, again, to note that the actual uh, percentage of our budget that goes on member salaries and expenses is about 0.059% of our entire budget. Um, there are several pressures there around interest rates. Uh, interest rates remain stubbornly high. UK interest rates are higher than those in Europe, they're higher than those in the USA. Clearly, that has a massive impact on borrowing that we took out historically many years ago. Um, and there are other pressures there. We have the North Wales Fire and Rescue Authority. Um, that's an increase of £547,000. There's the coroner's levy, £114,000. Um, there are some other good bits there in terms of increasing council tax premium. And clearly, that is designed to um, take off pressures off the housing, but there will be a cash benefit to this council of around £1.6 million. We then have business cases. So revenue business cases, again, we have only supported those which are absolutely vital and essential. Many of those are driven by pay and pay pressures. So we use private domiciliary care workers to look after our um, residents. Uh, they get pay rises in line with the, the real living wage. We have to fund that. We have care home fees that have increased year and year. Again, we have to fund that. You know, our residents deserve the best choice of residential homes. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there is very little choice with us in terms of these, pay, these pressures. Um, the grand total comes to um, £30 million. Pounds. So how are we funded now? In theory, 72% of our funding comes directly from Welsh Government. If you have pay and uh, pressures of £30 million, pounds, that would equate to £21 million. Pounds. But the reality is this year we've received a total of £4.6 million. Pounds. Alongside Gwynedd, that's the lowest settlement in Wales. So we all know the figure is calculated by a funding formula, which is, in my opinion, not fit for purpose, and it's many years out of date. It sees our neighbours in Denbyshire receiving 15% more per head, around £20 million pounds per year, and in Gwynedd, the figure is 10% per head. So in the current year alone, in their cash uplift, Denbyshire received just shy of an additional 
three million pounds in cash in cash and to give that some context that was that we would require an increase of four percent in council tax to actually make up that difference i continue to raise inequities produced by the formula every possible opportunity but you know it's clear there's sustained opposition to change from those that benefit essentially in some respects it's asking turkeys to vote for Christmas, but I will continue to do that. And I know every leader before me has done the same and our Senate members have raised it as well. So as bad as our settlement is, uh, members will note that we benefited from a floor which uh, improved our settlement by around uh, half a million pounds. We lost around 450 residents from the last census. The effect of that was millions of pounds lost from that budget. I want to record my thanks to my Deputy Leader, Councillor Emily, it is a fact that a couple of hours after giving birth to beautiful Caleb, she was on the phone lobbying hard to, to get a floor in place. That doesn't happen every year. And clearly, whilst it's disappointing in the situation we're in, uh, any extra money is, is really important to us. I know she's continued to lobby hard um, with both prospective candidates for the First Minister's post. It was disappointing when I saw the leaders' debate. There was no mention of local governments uh, and, and the importance of funding us and the funding formula. But I, I'd like to thank... Emily, for all the work that she continues to do with that. So I do recognise um, Welsh Government's budget has been eroded by 1.3 million. Those are facts and those are figures due to the ravages of high inflation. But uh, I think it's fair that there are choices that are made. There are things I think in an ideal world we'd all support, like free prescriptions and free school meals and some, some of the other projects. Um, but I think a question does have to be asked in these difficult times, whether these are still affordable. Um, so I want to turn around now to how we look to address the shortfall. You know, quite simply, we can make cuts, cut the budget, cut the uh, the services we provide, or we can cr increase our revenue by increasing council tax. So this budget proposes further cuts to our services of £12 million, split between service budget reductions of £7.8 million and £4.16 million to schools. Over the last 11 years, this authority has made cuts of £82 million, and that has been incredibly difficult. That is a huge sum of money. So making any further cuts is incredibly difficult. I've been uh, LEA governor since 2017 at two of my local schools, Eskol Glangella, Emersap Ewan. I was at governor's meeting until 8 o'clock last night, so I'm painfully aware of how difficult things are for schools. Before I joined the council, I was a parent governor at my children's primary school. Someone ironically, it was concerns over budgetary issues that actually was a, a driver for me to stand for council. So it, it's clearly not a new problem. Uh, members will be aware that our education department <coughs> recently had an outstanding Eston report. And I want to quote from that. The local authority prioritises funding for education and leaders have sought to protect schools from the budget cuts experienced by other services. However, this may be more challenging in the near future, given the authority's current financial position. So this is the reality of where we're at. You know, we have done our best year after year, but there is a finite amount that we can do. So schools like us set their own budget, and I'd like to take members to table four, which is on page 121. So I recognise that we are not able to give schools the full funding that they requested. Um, but members will note that this year there will be an overall increase in, of cash of £3.7 million to the budget, which is actually an uplift of 4.91%. And that was similar to what we did last year. I totally accept that it's really difficult for schools, but I don't think it's fair to say we cut their budgets. We didn't meet what they requested. But in real terms, there has been an increase. I'd also ask members to note, you know, we received um, some additional money in our budget from a consequential after a UK government announcement. So we received an additional £526,000. With that money, we have given 70% of that to schools to reduce that uh, initial ask from 6% to 5%. And I do think that that absolutely recognise that we do recognise the pressures they're under and we will do what we can. Um, Clearly, there are a talk about government amalgamating various grants in schools and, you know, where we can, if there's more money comes in, we will look to support our schools. Our young people are our future. We know schools are struggling with attendance rates. That requires more resource 
not less. You know, we are aware of that. But, I, you know, I, I essentially think we do absolutely everything that we can. So in looking to further reduce the funding cap, we've been able to remove some proposed increases in the utility bills. And um, that's due to falling prices, which is very much welcomed. We've also reduced the amount of money that we have to set aside uh, in, as a prediction for future pay pressures. Now, again, we do not set those pay pressures. We have minimum input into what they're set at, but um, interest rates are falling. We, we are now more in line with other councils, but there is a risk there. If the rates are higher than we've anticipated, we have to find that money. Um, and we've also looked where there are some capital projects that will not be delivered in the current financial year that we've looked to defer some of that spending and take that out. But again, you know, that puts pressure further down the line, but we have to do everything we can to try and close that gap. I want to record my sincerest thanks to our senior officers and cabinet members for the enormous work they've put in, which in what has been a really, really stressful situation. We're all very proud of the services we offer and having to cut that and knowing the damage that, that will undoubtedly cause to, to people who rely on those services is really, really hard. Um, but it's been approached in a really collaborative way. Uh, and for that, I absolutely thank everybody involved, and especially Amanda. You know, the clarity of the reports that we get are exceptional. I I've looked at other budgets across North Wales authorities. The amount of information, the way it's set out, is absolutely exceptional. So even after all that work, we're left with a remaining gap of £8 million. The fund this gap will require a council tax increase of 8.9% for council tax and 0.77% for the increase in the fire levy the North Wales Fire and Rescue Authority. And clearly residents will be interested in the combined figure, which is 9.67%. <laughs> so this is on the back of a 9.9% increase. You know, that's going to be incredibly difficult for our residents. Last time, year's rise was the first time that this authority's council tax level was higher than Denbyshire. It remains considerably lower than that in our neighbours in Gwynedd. On a national level, there are 350 um, council tax raising authorities. Um, Conway is actually the 90th lowest, so it's just outside the lower quartile in terms of the actual amount we charge. Around 10,500 of our households, out of 55,000 households, are supported by council tax reduction scheme. Uh, but I want to be clear, I don't want to minimise the severe pressure this increase will put on our residents. But we are essentially caught between a rock and a hard place. With those that are struggling the most, they're the ones who are most dependent on the services that we provide and, and finding that balance is incredibly tricky. So I just want to take you through the democratic process that's got us to where we are today. Um, we held six budget working groups throughout the year, as long ago as the 5th of May. The first meeting was essentially a debrief about the difficult process we went through last year. Um, all members were invited. We discussed you know, what information members would need, if there any training that members need, how would they get a better understanding of those council functions, conscious that last year, first year, sorry, was the first year for many new members. The second meeting, the 20th June, we looked at our social care budget. Social care and education make up 80% of our service budget, so that's clearly a big ticket for items, and we know the cost of children looked after can be, well, essentially... Uh, really ruinous to our budget, but again, it's a strategy service that we have to provide. On 18th of July, we looked at social care and the education budget. The meeting on the 5th of December was our environment, roads and facilities. On the 3rd of October, um, we had a, a sorry, the budget run group was, I don't see what that one was, apologies. Um, Oh yeah, sorry, this was um, uh, mixed from services. We had regular in housing, finance and audit, economy and culture, legal and people and performance, and IT. And finally, we had a budget work in schools where a number of our head teachers came along. It was really useful to hear it from the horse's mouth. I know 46 of us are governors in, in various schools throughout the county, so we do have a really good understanding of the pressures that schools um, face, but you know, there's the opportunity to have that really detailed face-to-face -face conversation. Um, I think it's fair to say some members attended those really, really well. Some not so good, which is a shame because that was an opportunity to see where we spend our money, to put ideas forward about where we could maybe save some money and what our options would be. Members will also be aware that we hold um, service reviews twice a year. Again, as a standing item in those service review, we have a budgetary item. We have um, 
officers are able to give a full and frank about the pressures they're under, about where their savings are to be made, what the consequences are moving forward. So again, it's a really useful way for members to scrutinise where we spend our money and why we spend our money. So I, you know, I've said before, I, I've looked at the way other authorities' budget process work. I'm confident that our process provides far better engagement for members and clear and concise information that's necessary for members to make these difficult decisions. So look into the future. You know, I've stated there are many factors out of our control, but as we discussed earlier, Gareth, we have to leave no stone unturned. Um, we have to look at transformational ways of delivering our services. We were the first council in Wales to invite the Welsh Local Government Association in last year to carry out a peer review. To us, in some respect, it was pleasing that they didn't identify any areas of concerns or any smoking guns. Um, they, they talked a lot about transformation. Um, unfortunately, they didn't actually identify what we need to transform and what we need to transform it to, which at the end of the day is the clever bit. Um, but I'm keen to, you know, to really explore all these options. Um, we're proposing that next year we will get CIFRA in um, to have a look at our budget lines, look at where our spend goes and have a real deep dive analysis. You know, who knows? I, I think we do things very well. We had a meeting with our regulators on Monday, very complimentary from Eston, from CIW and from Audit Wales. But we need to look at everything. We've talked about the opportunities of partnership working. You know, it's clear things have to change. It, it, I live by the border in Denbyshire. It seems a nonsense that road work stop at the border and they're not carried on. We need to explore all that. We talked about resilience in our team, teams. Corporate joint committees will be up and running. I think it's beholden on leaders to look and find ways that that can work. There's a natural kind of suspicion about that. Another authority is an anti-democratic, but in the situation that we're in, we absolutely have to explore all options. And as I said, we've had some really encouraging conversations with the Chief Executive of Denbyshire. I chair the North Wales Leadership Board. And again, I, I'm having those conversations with other leaders to say where we, where we can work together, where we can support each other. Okay. So, you know, I look forward, as I say, that there's lots of stuff going on. We know there will be some really exciting projects delivered this year uh, for our, our children looked after, Boyd and the Doll, Ingleside, Glanaravan, uh, Sylvia Gardens and Slandidno. These projects are active. The Housing Board, great to see Katie here. I took the Housing Portfolio in 2019 uh, and, I, and I've been pushing for a head of housing since then. We, we need to make those boards work quicker. We know that with our assets, we have to do more with those. We have to move more rapidly to, to get rid of assets that we don't need and realise the capital value. So that there's much that can be done and there's much that we absolutely need to do. And I genuinely look forward to working with you all in a collaborative fashion as we try and meet the, the challenges that um, our residents are facing, essentially, and our need to protect our um, vital services. So... I want to thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak at length. And I want to finish by now. Clearly, there'll be questions, and I'm obviously more than happy to take those. But I, but I will move the recommendations on page 103, which is 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to go and sit down because I suspect we'll be here for some time. So thank you. Thank you very much. I have a proposer. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Chair. And can I also thank the leader? Like the leader has already said, it's we have to, as councillors, to set a budget for 2024-2025. Officers and mem cabinet members have been for months now, working on the budget, and our thanks to them for that. Nobody in the chamber, I'm sure, wants to increase tax or want to see cuts in services. We already have heard an e-petition complaining about cuts in education, and nobody in this room disagrees with that. But the truth is, until the ministers in Cardiff Bay and London give us more money to local authorities to fund education and other services properly, then nothing will change. And local authorities will have to continue to 
produce budgets with cuts and tax increases. So after saying that, I will second the proposal like as we as authority receive this budget. Thank you, Councillor Austin. I will open it up to the floor. Any questions or Councillor Emery? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my questions are around uh, education, so whether Councillor Charlie or Councillor Julie wishes to answer them. The first one is about having a, a plan in place uh, for future years for schools. Um, I notice what uh, Gwyneth were doing in terms of their plan, looking at their um, reports. And last March, uh, Gwyneth Council um, agreed to cap a maximum 3% cut on all individual mainstream schools uh, with no cuts for the special sector. And that 3% cut was to be applied over two financial years, 7 twelfths one year, uh, 5 twelfths the year after. So they did 7 twelfths in 23, 24, and 5 twelfths in the financial year that they're going to decide on their budget next week. So that gives schools in Gwynedd uh, a chance and, and time to plan. So um, I think that is absolutely essential if there's more cuts coming down the line that we can't be sat, as I have been in finance meetings with headmasters, um, debating with sort of last week, oh, it's now going to be 5%. Oh, right, great. And suddenly changing your whole budget. Schools need to know where they are. And, and if Gwyneth can, one, give quite a lower cut over two financial years, considering they had the lowest settlement in, in the e AEF, I don't know why we can't do that. Um, so I would like to ask um, Councillor Julie probably about going forward, can we give a two-year plan to schools like uh, Gwyneth have done. And my second question is, of course, on the redundancy payments. Um, I can't remember which meeting it was in. I think we asked Amanda, did we have an idea of, of the figure that that would entail? I think she sort of said around 200K. Now, fair play to Councillor Julie. She has sat down online with every school uh, and, and gone through exactly what the savings are going to mean uh, for each individual school. But so do we now have an idea of the amount of redundancy payments? Is it going to be around quarter of a million or are we going to move that up to half a million? I, I don't know, because if it's half a million or above, where's the budget line for that? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Louise, um, for your questions. Uh, I agree to have a plan in place makes sense we have attempted to do that to a certain extent before but as you can appreciate it's hard when you don't know the overall budget that you're getting i mean i'm happy to sit down with amanda and lori um, and team to look at perhaps having something in place but we need to be conscious that we can't put you know three percent across two years um if we don't have a clue where we're going to in terms of budgets, because that means then that we're basically putting a significant cut reduction in to other departments. But yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to sit down with Amanda and look at what we possibly could do. Um, it just would be helpful if both UK and Welsh government could then maybe stick to some kind of um, forward plan as well over whether that's two years or, or three years. And then in terms of redundancy payments, I don't have a figure of all schools yet because, as you can appreciate, they have to um, follow a process where they have quite late meetings, usually extraordinary meetings with their governing bodies to confirm um, some of which, well, majority of which thus far have been voluntary redundancies, but I believe that we are moving forward to possibly compulsory redundancies. So it's not straightforward. What I can tell you is that um, following the two redundancy panels um, that, that we've had so far, we're closer to the half a million mark. Um, but obviously, once I get that figure um, going forward, then that will come through, uh, come through to to members. But but yeah, it's a it's a moving, um, it's a moving figure. Um, whilst we await uh, to see where schools where schools finish, um, I think that really is probably all I can share. Whether Amanda wants to add anything further to that in terms of where that that money is coming from. Then I'd hand over to Amanda. Thanks. Yeah, Julie. Councillor Louise, I'd just like to bring in um, Amanda, if you don't mind. 
Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Julie. Thank you, Councillor Louise. Um, yeah, uh, just uh, just in terms of the uh, redundancy costs. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not aware I ever quoted uh, a figure, but uh, I think uh, as uh, Councillor Julie uh, has outlined, I think we already are aware from the panels that it, it's around the half a million and uh, um, may well therefore uh, become more substantial. In in terms of how that would be funded, then then as I think I've alluded to before, I think we obviously would need to rely on our uh, balances uh, and and or um, look at flexibilities we may have around uh, capital receipts uh, as well for consideration uh, and and uh, yeah it's certainly a, a, a concern ultimately but um, recognizing of course that it's a one-off cost uh, which then yields uh, permanent uh, savings going forward and um, I, I would perhaps just uh, indulge if that's as well just re making reference to Gwyneth um, I, I, I will uh, look into uh, that and, and obviously as as Councillor Julie says look look at uh, you know whether there's any way we can uh, seek to do something similar, but I I would just make the observation that Gwyneth um, have the luxury of of substantial reserves and balances, and and therefore perhaps that uh, uh, affords them the opportunity to to give that certainty to schools a little better than we can, because they'll always be able to fall back on 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 those substantial balances. But uh, yeah, ha happy obviously uh, to 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 liaise with Julie about how we can take that forward. Is that right, uh, Councillor Louise? Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly, if Gwyneth can do it, we can do it. And they prioritised education last year. That They know that means that there's more cuts to other services. So I think we should definitely look at their good practice. And then secondly, redundancy payments is a bit of a grey area, that for me. If we're now half a million up to three quarters of a million, it may be one off, but that needs to be in the budget line today, I'd thought. So I'm a bit dubious about voting for a budget when we've got three quarters of a million quid to find, which is going to come from reserves, it sounds like. But we don't know. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks, Louise. I mean, like, like you, I do think we need um, a better business planning framework that's inclusive for schools and makes um, pr provision for them and for us to listen to them more effectively than, than we currently do. Um, I mean, my primary concern is about the size of the council tax increase and, and the way that we're going to be spending it and specifically its, its impact on, on our schools. I mean, Helen Wilson and 1,396 residents have taken time to express their views um, and I share their concern and I note their request. I mean, bottom line is I believe this budget sets up Conway schools to fail and they do that by imposing a 5.5% cut. That's a bad choice and it is a choice, despite what's having been said. We can choose to make different um, decisions. Um, and I think if this choice is made today, we will live to regret it if it's voted through. It's a figure that's been plucked out of the air. I made that point last week at Finance and Resources Scrutiny. Um, and when I challenged, um, none of the cabinet present were either prepared or able to offer any evidence that the 6% figure that was was um, was plucked out of there at the time they made it, that it was fair, that it was reasoned or that it was deliberal, uh, d deliverable um, or without significant harm. And in fact, the, the figure was plucked out of the air in Cabinet before they'd even asked schools for their views about the impact and what it would mean. Um, Louise has already talked about Gwyneth. Um, I think it's a 2% cut in, in this current year uh, as part of this two-year deal that Louise has talked about. I think, I've, I, as I understand it, it's a 0% cut for schools in Anglesey and it's a 3% cut for schools in Denbyshire and Flintshire. So Conway is an outlier, and obviously I understand some of the reasons uh, for that, and obviously Amanda has talked about the, the fact that we've got very uh, limited reserves. Um, but, you know, to absorb this 5.5% cut, our schools are having to wipe out 59% of the reserves. All other services combined are going to be uh, using just 8% of their reserves to balance their budgets. Um, so how can that be fair and how can that be reasonable? Um, but beyond that, the Cabinet have treated schools differently from all other schools, and that is absolutely unfair in my view. They have approved lower percentage cuts for many other services when those services said it was all they could deliver. 
The principle of that I subscribe to, but why wasn't that principle applied to our schools? Because schools were imposed with this cut before the survey, and then the survey results have actually been ignored, um, and actually they haven't been published, which I find astonishing. Surely to goodness, we as members ought to have for our consideration a published analysis of the school's head teacher's survey results. Um, we've actually implicitly done that when we agreed to take lower cuts from other areas across the councils. Why not schools? Um, so the 5.5% 5, 5 .5%, uh, reduction to that, I mean, Charlie's right, when Westminster passported Welsh Government extra money, that then was passported um, by Welsh Government. Um, so it's not that we within Conway have actually looked at um, finding other other means, it's just we've passported. And I thank, I thank the Cabinet for doing that. But when you look at the totality of how we've treated our schools in this budget process, how can any of this be fair? And how can we be so cloth-eared when head teachers are begging us for mercy uh, when we're just about to hang them out to dry? Charlie's right, the majority of us are governors, and it's been horrendous last last week, two weeks. Um, and in fact, we've been struggling uh, at school levels to even get clarity of financial information to be able to make decisions. Um, so how can how can it be fair and how can we be cloth eared? And actually, how can the public believe us when this report says we're prioritizing schools? Uh, when in actual fact we're asking, um, for example, a cut to social services that we also say we're, we're prioritising, which is fine, but we've only asked them for 3.1 million because that's all they say they can afford. And yet we're asking schools for 4.1 million when they're protesting and shouting um, from their afters. Um, and yet, when also it looks at giving revenue business cases, OK, we're giving 500,000 because Gogarth is desperate in terms of staff shortage. We're not giving any other additional revenue uh, but business case to schools. And yet we're giving 9.3 million back to social services who, who only have offered up 3.1 million in cuts. You know, where is the fairness and the reasonableness um, around this? Uh, I, can't, I can't support this um, based upon this sort of unfair behaviour. So some questions there that I would really quite like we can to have answered, particularly around, um, you know, why we're not publishing the head teacher's analysis so that informs our decision making um, and why also our cabinet sort of not giving a fair and due, and due uh, fair approach to our schools like other services. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Kazan, I'll refer you to the leader, Councillor Charlie. So, I think what I want to touch on, and you're right, there are choices to be made. Um, you were a member of a cabinet in uh, 1920, sorry, 1919, 1920. You said a. 1920? No, 1912. <laughs> All right, so. Budget was set in seven guineas. <laughs> no, 1920. So, council tax then was 9.6%. So, I'm aware last year it was 9.9. That was the biggest headline figure ever. But the fire levy last year was 1.07%. The actual amount we raised for this council was 8.8%. In 1920, the actual amount raised for this council um, was about 9. Point, let me get this right. Um, yeah, 9.03%. So that was actually the biggest increase in taxation coming in from council tax this council has ever had. The pressures that were faced then were 16.38 million pounds. Last year with 36 million pounds, this year we've got just shy of 30 million pounds. That budget took 4% out of schools. I've read that budget report. There's no inequality, but there's no assessments. I don't see the information that you're talking about now. That budget also used a million pounds of reserves. So you had a smaller challenge, but still schools got a 4% 4, 4 cut. So I think you know what we're doing Whilst I don't want to make any cuts to schools, I think it is proportionate relative to the size of the challenge we face. And let's remember interest rates then, base rate was 0.25%. Actual interest rates were around, I think, about 1.8% then, or certainly well below 2%. There wasn't the same pay pressure. There wasn't the same payment on interest and loans. But that was decisions you made then. And I would make the same case then. You had half the challenge we had, but still schools had to give up, cough up 4%. So... 
you know, I think it's important to remind people of that. In terms of the um, responses to our neighbours, last year, Demonstrate used £4 million reserves, Gwynedd used £4 million reserves. This year, Angus are using £4 million reserves. They put incredibly low figures for their, their pay increases. I think it's around 2.85%. We, I joined this council in 2017 and we didn't have reserves. As recently as 2013, this council had the, the third lowest council tax in Wales. Well, not, those, those decisions were made long ago, but our reserves were run down to a level which is dangerous. And as we face a crisis now, that has a direct impact. So if I had reserves, I would put them in schools. Absolutely. You know, I would do, but I don't. And our job is to work through this. Schools, the we, we, had, we were told by Welsh Government that it would be 3%, and it was, well, it wasn't, we didn't get 3%, but it was 3%. We told the schools the same. 72% of our funding, we're going to get 3%. So that message has been really clear all the way through. We were very clear about our uh, our ability to raise council tax, and we were very clear about the actual level of reserves we had. So it doesn't come as a surprise, but we get our figure um, week before Christmas, then we get told we're getting a little bit more. So I, I don't agree that there's not been the discussion. The fact that schools find that incredibly hard um I, I absolutely get that um and i think there's in years gone by there has been a bit of a white horse coming over the hill and giving us a bit more money and we've, we've not been as bad as we thought but this is not the case this year so you know we are where they are but um I, i'll leave it there chair thank you yeah hello i'll leave you come back once uh Councilor Anne, and then i need to move on yeah yeah, I, I mean, I will come back. Um, and obviously, um, the past is the past, and I completely get that there's a different challenge then and there's a different challenge now. Um, I suppose the bigger point I'm making is we are um, treating schools differently, which is inherently discriminatory and unfair. Um, and therefore, on the back of that, to pluck figures out and to expect them to jump that high when we're not treating other services in a similar way is inherently and comparatively unfair unfair and I don't think Charlie in any of his words in response has actually um, replied to that. It's the same point I made in, scr in, in scrutiny a week ago. Um, 6% was plucked out of the air by a cabinet member and everybody unanimously agreed for it for schools and that's without any consultation with it with the 59 schools that's the inherent unfairness that leads to a, a really significant fact and and obviously I am seriously concerned that we are harming our schools and our school staff in what we're doing but I also pay tribute to Charlie for you know a lot of the stuff that he said and all, all of the work that he's doing because these are impossible times to try and balance a budget but there needs to be an underlying fair process that doesn't do significant harm to our, our learners. Thanks, Chair. I'll go to Councillor Julie, then I'll go to Gera. Okay. Um, I, I, I think so many of your comments are incredibly unfair. I think it's easy to sit in opposition and try and point score for your own um whether that's a residence or whatever it is. Obviously, Anne, you see yourself as the voice of schools. It, to call us cloth-eared and to say we're hanging schools out to dry is is completely, completely incorrect and, and unfair. We engage with schools consistently. As Charlie mentioned before, we have over 46, 47 um, councillors, um, members who are on governing bodies the whole point of that is that gives us the opportunity to understand what's happening in our schools we have the school budget forum which again you wrote off as though it's irrelevant it's not irrelevant it's something that's really important we have looked and worked with schools to address how that can be most appropriate so schools feel heard so that members here appreciate and understand the position that schools are in. We have increased how often that meets. It now meets very regularly. We have pre-meetings with the chair, who is the head teacher of one of our secondary schools. Um, its uh, deputy is one of the head teachers of one of our primary schools. They see our agendas going forward as a local authority. We see theirs and it gets fed back through scrutiny. We've had... Um, we had 11 head teachers attend the um, the budget working group for schools who gave us plenty of opportunity to talk to them about everything and anything. Uh, Charlie and I, along with the strategic team, meet with head teachers 
representatives monthly to discuss the situation in terms of where we are financially. Amanda gives an update there. Head teachers have a very open, honest conversation with us. We I meet separately with head teachers anytime they request. Um, to discuss whether that's finances. I've gone along with David, um, the finance um, uh, person responsible for schools, um, to numerous schools to sit down and go through the budget. David and his team work incredibly hard with the schools um, in order to to look at where where they're at financially way before we come to budget budget setting and suggest that we pluck the figure out of the air you know, is again incredibly unfair. It was 10%. We told schools from the beginning that they had to work towards 10%. Thankfully, because of things that we have done as a local authority, we managed to reduce that down to 6% and reduce it again further to 5.5, which ultimately will probably end up being about 5.3%. That has taken a lot of hard work and that has come as a result of listening to our schools Am I happy? No, I'm not happy. I would like there to be additional funding that comes from UK government, Welsh government, to ensure that local authorities can afford to do what they want to do. None of us want to sit here and look at a reduction, but we've worked really hard to find the best option that we can. And we will continue to do that. We'll continue to lobby both governments to ask that they find additional funding. There's a new leader, First Minister, coming in in Wales um, imminently. I certainly will lobby. I'm, I'm sure that Charlie and Emily will lobby again to ask that we look for additional funding for schools. But to call us cloth-eared and say we're hanging schools out to dry is very unfair. And that's um, just point scoring that, quite frankly, is so inappropriate. Yes, Julie. Right. Uh, Councillor Channel. The old Councillor Evil. Um, I've got a couple of questions and uh, an observation. My questions are, when will you have the redundancy figures, please? I think to Julie, um, I've been asking around, uh, I've taken a sample of different schools and it looks like it's going to be over a million for the redundancy payments. And also the second question, what about loans to schools? Have we got any indication yet when those loans um, are going to come in, when we've got the figures and we know quite what's going to happen to the reserves? And um, on terms of reserves, I think, Councillor Charlie, you said that when you came in in 2017, the reserves were at the lowest ever. So I would suggest you looked at the, a previous administration for that one. Um, so those are the two questions. And the rest is an observation um, just to say that uh, we as the Conservative group are very glad that we did the call in from your cabinet decision of the 23rd of January. Um, that resulted in you making quite a considerable new turn on your proposed 6% cuts to education, four weekly nappy collections, a modelled 11% council tax rise, and your refusal to adequately fund safeguarding posts in social care. So we have got a, a slight U-turn from that. But residents cannot take another rise like this on top of 9.9. .9. Last year, um, the highest in, in, in Wales, as, as has been frequently pointed out. So that's my observation. But the um, two questions, please. One around, when are we going to have the redundancies? And what do you think of those projected figures? And secondly, um, what about the amount of the loans. Thank you. I'll bring Councillor Julie in and then I'll ask Amanda just to... Uh, yeah, and they'll... Um, uh, yeah, in terms of the redundancy, I, I don't have any clearer figures for you yet, Cheryl, because it, it's really difficult to to um, to look at. Let me just... Um, as I said before, we're just over half a million currently, but we're waiting for details and I don't want to sit here, give a figure and then it come back um that that um that i'm so many thousands out uh in terms of the loans process that has been put together i mean amanda may want to come in on this um and i think that um it's possibly next week forgive me um that we are opening the loan process it's not opened as yet um but we'll be opening the loan process for for schools then to to begin to look at that and I know that Lori and the team are putting a timetable together because obviously we'll need to have meetings those that are under a hundred thousand will be something that that um as was 
brought through scrutiny that the strategic directors uh, in consultation with myself and Charlie as the finance portfolio holder um, will look at and those over 100,000 will come through scrutiny and I know they're working with the team to look at possible dates. Um, I am aware that I think in terms of absolutely finalising the budget um, Lori and I discussed yesterday and I believe it's a date in June which I can't remember the exact date again Amanda might be able to give that that schools have in terms of time scales for us to go through the the loan process but um, yeah that's that's all I can give you for now Cheryl but as I said before I'm more than happy once we have clarity around redundancies uh, to to give a sort of final figure once once we've got the next few uh, lined up. Thank, my next one is tomorrow I'm, I'm in all day tomorrow you. redundancy yeah I mean we could be talking millions couldn't we in redundancy payments and loans as a result of of the cut so it's really frightening and as we as I think it was Councillor Louise that asked about where in the budget line is this money going to come from so we look forward to hearing that thank you very much I'll bring in Amanda now right um, yes, yeah, so, so um, I have drawn reference uh, in the uh, report on page uh, 124 in paragraph 7.32 that there, uh, there is the risk, or, or rather the council will be faced with redundancy costs, uh, which were at the time of writing unquantified, uh, which would need to fall on balances. So the report does does set that out. Um, as as um, as has already been said, uh, you know, we the the due processes are being followed in terms of the timescales. Uh, a lot of work's going on in, with individual schools to help support them, and and obviously we can't quantify it until uh, with in in final terms until all of those processes have, have continued. But um, as as I uh, said earlier, um, it, it is likely that it that it may well be in the region of uh, a million pound. And, and as I say, that will have to come from uh, come from our balances. Um, in terms of the uh, loan arrangements, um, again, um, you know, in, in preparation um, of of uh, the the need that that schools more schools may may need loans. Um, obviously, the, that uh, a revised process uh, was brought through democracy to to agree uh, how that uh, uh, will work. Uh, what I would observe is 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 uh, you know loans still need to be. Uh, applied for in exceptional circumstances, so it isn't a, an opening of the floodgates for every school to come and 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 ask for a loan, and 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 hence we're working uh, closely with each individual school to help them uh, manage their budget position and avoid that position. Uh, to the extent there will be some loans, oh, so that there may be some schools that may may require a loan, uh, then uh, a detailed timetable is being put in place now. Schools have to set a balanced budget um, by the end of June. Um, um, and and as uh, so a timetable as as uh, I've seen a draft timetable uh, uh, which is just being agreed to effectively ensure uh, schools are aware of when they would need to start that process to allow us to go through those uh, appropriate um, appropriate processes and equally uh, I think uh, uh, work's been done to make sure that the uh, both finance and resources and education uh, scrutiny uh, nominate. Um, members to be on the panel uh, that will consider those cases that are that are above 100,000. So all of that is being um, put in place and, and we'll know, um, I think I think the start of that timetable, if you just bear with me while I quickly look, uh, I think the start of that timetable is that schools would need to be approaching us uh, sometime in April. Uh, to uh, determine whether whether they need a loan at that point in time, so we'll we'll have clearer um, information starting to come through over the next month uh, as we as we continue to work with schools to uh, hopefully get them to a balanced uh, position uh, and knowing which ones may or may not need a loan. Hope that helps. Anybody else want to speak, Councillor David Carr? Thank you, Chair. Uh, my thoughts on, on the budget, really, are that, you know, you don't solve holes in the budget by increasing council tax, particularly above inflation. Inflation is now running at 4%. So it's, it's David, can you speak into your microphone properly? I can't hear you properly. Those online can't hear you. So you put your microphone to your mouth, please. Thank you, Andrew. There was bossy. I'm sure Andrew wants to hear what I have to say. And, and can you hear me now, Andrew? 
Yes. You can hear me now. Great. So Yes, thank you very much, David. I I will start again. Listen. Right. We're in unprecedented times. I don't believe that that by putting council tax up and then putting council tax up by more that the rate of inflation is the way to plug holes in the budget. That's not the way to do it. We need to look at non-essential spending, services that are not essential. And that's what we need to look at. And that's what we haven't done. And we have, we're having big council tax rises year on year now. Uh, this latest council tax rise, if you look at the last six years, it's now looking, if we, if we go for this nearly 10%, looking at 54% increase in council tax. Of, of that, if we look at the inflation rate uh, for the first five years, when it was 2.5%, and we look at the inflation rate last year and this year, we're looking at nearly a 25% in real terms increase in council tax, and then we're told the reserves are low. So, you know, what residents are saying is we have this real term increase in council tax over and above inflation of nearly 25%. Where's the money gone? And that, that's what residents are asking. We need to have a freeze on non-essential spending, really. And really, we shouldn't be hiring in the way we, ha we are when, when we're in this financial situation. Every job that, that comes up should be a job that, that provides a frontline service or a backup to a frontline service. We shouldn't be looking at other jobs, really. And this, I'm out on consultants and I asked Amanda uh, to give me the figures. We're looking at like £340,000 on consultants. You know, really, we shouldn't be spending a penny on consultants when we're in the financial situation we're in. So, you know, that's another one. Then there's the pet projects like the rugby pitch. You know, and things like that. You know, a resident asking why we're spending that when we're cutting things like care line, but for the most vulnerable, we're cutting things like that. And we're spending things that are not really essential to this council, not essential to residents. And we do need to use cash reserves. Again, I spoke to Amanda yesterday, cash reserves 25 million. I asked the question, how much is available to spend today if we need? And she said 9 million. So I, I think we could look to spend 3.5 million of that to get that council tax down below 5%. That's what we need to do. And how we build up reserves in the future is through efficiencies, not by increasing council tax. And also about sharing services, and that was mentioned in the, the, the previous conversation. I don't know why we weren't moving on that. I mean, it would benefit Denbyshire, if it's Denbyshire or Gwyneth and us, to actually share those services, to cut the costs for their residents and our residents. And instead of just talking about it, I think we need to move on that. And that would be, that would be good, wouldn't it? So I, need to, I think we need to get a grip on the finances. Home to school transport. I mean, it's totally out of control really you know we've actually got at the moment we've got a review that review is not happening until february but home to school transport is totally out of control you know and we really need to look at that that non strategy home to school transport we can't afford to pay for it so, so they're my thoughts on it really that what we need to do we need to take some money out of the cash reserves because that's what it's there for to get that council tax below below five percent because that's what residents are actually looking at that they're the kind of pay rises in the real world people are getting five percent they're not getting pay rises of nearly ten percent so they're my thoughts on it that this budget isn't delivering for the residents it's not delivering for the residents the council tax is too high and we're not really looking inward to ourselves to actually look to make to make meaningful cuts in services that are not just not a I've got time to go through, through them all, but we need to look at those jobs when we're hiring people, that every job is, is, is for a frontline service or is a backup for a frontline service. So Chair, I, point I, of I, won't, order. I won't be... Point of order. Can I just finish what I'm saying? I won't be supporting the budget today. I'm, I'm finishing now, so you can you can have your, uh, your time. I won't be supporting the budget today because I don't think it's fair on residents to, to increase council tax in the last six years by 54%. It's actually totally, to to totally not not right, and I, I can't support it. Thank you. Yeah, that's David. Would anyone like to retort? Chair, Chair? there's a point point of order raised. Sorry, raised. Yeah, Chair, sorry, thank you. Sorry. With respect, Councillor David, gone on for you allowed him to go on for five minutes. Well, he clearly knows if you disagree with the budget, he should have alternative budget. It's so good. we we all feel the way he feels, and we all like to please our residents. Uh, but that was no need for it. It's an open forum, uh, councillor, and it's it's right for him to air his views. So I I have to I have to give a, Chair, a reasonable but, time. Airing view is one thing, and not getting an alternative budget and lecturing all of us is something different. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor, gentlemen, gen 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 gentlemen. <laughs> Chair, if I may, no, that, it wasn't a point of order, but the point's been made. 
Um, so if, if it's a point of order, it's about whether there's been a clear breach of the rules that needs to be identified or there's a breach of the law. Councillor Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Council tax has gone up year after year. The money that we got from Welsh Government has gone down year after year. You have a between 2010 and 2019, the funding that councils have dropped by 17%. The funding that went to the NHS went up by 16%. So there's a 33% differential in the level of funding we receive uh, and the level that the NHS receives. I think council tax is very unusual, isn't it? It's the only tax that comes out of people's salary every month. It's very, very visible. I think it was a bit of an unwritten rule that we would provide services. The majority of that funding would come from central government for the vital services, the statutory services, and we would go to our residents to look to fund the nice-to-haves. What's clear, what's happening, is less and less of that core budget is coming. So money is diverted from non-essential services, and these are things that residents really appreciate to other services which we have to provide. So, you know, the, the numbers are the numbers. The balance we have to find is what are the cuts do you make? You did email me and you're saying it's the pathway to this budget is easy. We just need to cut non-statutory, non-essential services. I did email you back and that would be brilliant. Can you please let me know what, what that is? Because I found it really difficult to balance this budget. You didn't reply to that. And you identify things. The, the rugby pitch was done to death. It was came through scrutiny. It was called in. Came back to scrutiny. is improved by scrutiny because it saves forty grand a year. We've got a, a Six Nations rugby tournament there for a weekend. So you know, there's things that have happened. Things which will actually save us money. Um, that you keep bringing up, even though it's gone through a democratic process, and it's not helpful. And if you can find thirty million pounds of 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 savings from non-statutory services, then I genuinely wish you'd share it with me because I, I don't get a lot of sleep at nights worrying about this. In terms of the employment, I, I think, Reen, you know, it'd be useful to bring you in to talk about what we actually do in terms of a, a non a, a post. So if you would, Reen. Yeah, I, 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 I did want to come back on that because um, we have introduced... So we have vacancy control anyway, so there's vacancy control. So any vacancy will go to a panel to address. Over the past three or four months, those have been escalated to both myself uh, and Amanda to look at them and to assess whether they're essential or not. What I would also say is a, a substantial amount of our of the roles that are advertised are funded through grant funding. So they don't come from our core funding. So there's all these elements that we have to consider when we, when we assess these vacancies. And clearly there are frontline services that we have no choice but to recruit to. I would also make the point is this council would not survive without the back office staff that are, that are there to, to, to make sure that those services are run in the appropriate way. Um, I, I'm sure, to, to be fair, I, I, I completely understand the point made around consultants. The only thing I would say on consultants is that money spent on matters that we don't have the expertise in-house to undertake. So that would include um, expert engineers. It would include expert um, barristers or whatever we need in different circumstances that we wouldn't have in-house. If we were to recruit to those roles in-house, there would be a cost involved there as well. Um, and we know how difficult recruitment is, especially in specialist professional roles. Um, I, I guess the only other point I would make, home to school transport, uh, there is a consultation ongoing at the moment on that. So so that, that will come through the democratic process. And with regard to reserves, Clearly, reserves are a one-off. So, so if you find reserves now, you will need to find that extra moving forward. Um, looking at what all the other authorities are doing at the moment in plugging gaps with reserves, that will come back next year, I would imagine, um, with substantial gaps getting bigger and bigger. Um, I, I, I'm not saying you know our issues next year will will be equally as tough, but um, what we what we would wouldn't want to do is to uh, kick the can down the road not to make a diff difficult decision now and make it doubly difficult in a year's time. The gap next year is going to be substantial in any event. If we if we plug with balances now, that could put us in a very difficult position moving forward. And as, as I think Amanda has constantly um, uh, advised, uh, our level of reserves are, are very low compared to our neighbours, which means that we are unable to take some of these risks that some of our neighbours are. So so that I'm just covering those points. Um, well, I'm happy to to look at any uh, joint working, and as Councillor uh, Charlie has has mentioned, 
those conversations are ongoing. And I, I, I get the feeling also that um, other authorities across the north are feeling the same now. Maybe five, six years ago, that might have been a little bit different. So, yes, we will grab whatever opportunities there are out there in order to make our, our, our uh, what we provide for our residents more efficient so, uh, 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 and a better service, if that's possible. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you Diolch. Um, you know, I find it really, really difficult to support a budget where we're taking some major unquantifiable risks. There's been a huge amount of talk about the reserves and the dangerous level that the reserves have actually dropped to. We've covered the fact that the school's reserves are dropping 60%, so they'll only have about £4 million left. We've covered the fact that our reserves are around the 9 to £10 million mark. We failed to hit the budget last year, which meant that I think £1.7 million has had to be taken out of reserves. This budget indicates that we're already planning on taking for over £400,000 out of reserves. And within the risks, it's a medium to high risk that we won't be able to, de we won't be able to deliver some of the cost savings that we're committing to. And if we don't do that, that'll actually have, have to come out of reserves. You know, we've covered the education bit, the redundancies. We don't really know how much of that is going to have to come out of reserves. Loans, I understand it, to schools will have to be offset against cash balances, which come out of reserves. Um, and, you know, so it's, you know, we've got very, very limited reserves. The plan, as I understood it last year, was that we were going to be structuring our capital repayments at the beginning of the year so that we actually was able were able to put some of that money aside into reserves because the loans aren't actually drawn down until the funds are actually needed so that would build you know there was a plan there or a strategy there to build up reserves but that has been now been kicked down the road and i understand the reasons why in that we're trying to keep the council tax down to a lower to a lower level um, you know, we've got a medium term financial plan in place now, but, you know, it's it's one of the shorter ones I've seen is only two years. You know, I think we need to lengthen that out so that we've actually got that longer term strategy. You know, we need a medium term asset management plan so that we know where we're going with our buildings, that we've got a rolling program of repairs to the buildings because that is going to come back and haunt us if we aren't able to do this. And also, we need a plan to change the way we actually deliver the services. Of, of, again, that medium-term plan, to be fair to our residents and also to be fair to the staff that are working for the council. We've got to see some, you know, how, you know, have we got a vision? Have we got a plan to actually work our way through this difficult position? Because that, that medium-term plan tells us that if we don't change the way we do things, we're going to be sat here next year and the year after having exactly this same conversation, that we're having to push the council tax higher than any of us are comfortable to do, and we're having to cut services to the state where we're actually affecting the services we're delivering the residents. And that's a really difficult place for officers to be working in, because all they can see is that there's going to be these just these blanket cuts across the board. And I know it's easy to say that we have, you know, we'll come up with a plan to change the way we work. But, you know, to be fair, social services are starting to talk about transformation and changing the way they deliver services to actually save some money. And it's not all about cuts. It's actually looking at are there different ways we can do things? Are we able to collaborate with things but to do that we need that overall vision from the council um you know and these transformations actually are going to cost money and we need the reserves to actually fund that and so you know i think there should be budgets in in there and plans in there for those medium term plans rather than that we go from budget to budget just cutting you know putting blanket cuts across the council because as I've said before, the definition of madness is doing the same thing time and time again, but expecting different results. We need to change the way we're doing things. We need to look at op possible opportunities 
but we need some plans in place for that. But also we need that fighting fund of the reserves, which are really low at the moment already, to be able to fund that and give departments some confidence that, yes, we know where we're going. We've got a plan to do this and we've got some funds to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do agree with a lot of Gareth said. I think our asset management disposal needs to be faster. Um, we hope now have got a head of service who will look after that. Um, a lot of these decisions are unpopular, but nothing's as unpopular as going out with another essentially 10% financial tax rise. But, I, but you know, we are, 28% of our budget comes from council tax. The rest, we, we are essentially have got a begging bowl out there. During COVID, this council was really well funded. We went out with it 2.95% council tax because that was what the gap was. Which schools reeled to build the reserves up. It's not that long ago, schools reserves were around about 1.8 million. They got to 10 million because there was extra funding there. I don't think the schools did anything different, but there was more money put in. So there's more at the end of it. But there's choices to be made. Our money goes to the UK government. There's a budget next week. And there needs to be realisation that local authorities are struggling. There was a program on last night, there was a Conservative leader and a, and a Labour leader and they were both saying exactly the same thing. There's limits to what you can do on your own. If the funding isn't sufficient you're really going to struggle. The report contains um, looking at future plans. We're looking at a cash neutral budget. We go to our schools now and say there'll be no more money for you next year. Well they make more people redundant. That will bring more costs to us and that, that money will go. Then you get a whatever a change of policy, change of government, more money suddenly appears. Oh why'd you get rid of all those people? You know, So you're absolutely right. We need certainty, and you can make plans based on certainty. But if you're getting your budget first week in December, and then maybe a bit more thrown at you, that becomes incredibly difficult. I absolutely recognise your concerns about reserves. But where we are now, we could get another 700 grand, pick up another 1% of council tax. We could do another 3%, it would be 2 million. We could do that. And I, I think from a financial point of view, you know, fiscally it would be a sound thing to do, but residents can't afford it. So there is a balance here. And people will say all the time, oh, you wouldn't last in the private sector. The private sector's a piece of cake. You know, you do, you do your job, you charge fees, you whatever, you can you can manage that. But we, we, we are not in control of our destiny for many things. That said, I absolutely do recognise that we need to do better with the element that we have got control of. And I, I am absolutely committed to do that. But we are bound by legislation as well. You know, the CJC could do X, Y and Z. Well, no, you can't. You have to do it this way. You have to do it that way. You have to get democratic support. It is a difficult balance. But where we are now... Yeah, reserves, cut more services, increase more council tax, then we can boost our reserves. Otherwise, what, what other options are there? So thank you, you know, and I say, I, I agree with them all that you're saying. Yeah. Councillor Tom, then Councillor Gromley. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I think I must be stuck in some type of recurring nightmare because we were here in this place last year talking then about huge black holes, unthinkable cuts, and massive tax rises. So... I have to think back, what's, what's, what's brought us back here nearly 12 months later? Well, we have spent £600,000 on, on, on a 4G pitch. And Charlie, I hear what you're saying. Uh, the figures that were put in front of us showed that it will save us money o o over 15 years. I, I, I disagree with those figures, but let's just assume they're right. We don't need the £600,000 back in, in 15 years. We need it now. Because we took a loan. Yeah, but you're going to recoup the cover of that loan over 15 years. You've borrowed that money now. You're paying in. You're paying interest on it. We're not going to clear that debt until so the 50 money years we save time. every year. Every year on the maintenance of that facility pays for the loan, and it creates a surplus income. So it saves money on a yearly basis. Yeah. Excuse me. Do you mind? Thank you. <laughs> so we've also spent nearly half a million pound of SBF. Funding money, money that should that should be used to create opportunities for residents. Instead, more than half a million of it has come into our not reserves, but we've but we've spent it like Louis said, and to some residents it feels like we're marking our own test scores there. Uh, we've also had all of the issues with the paddling pools, where members were getting their updates from the press and the newspapers. We've had a housing crisis, which has gone from bad to, in my view, worse. I accept that that we now have a head of housing and I have to thank the administration for that. I think it's a long overdue post, but it has got worse since we were here 
last year. And I, I can't see a plan forward right now. Uh, we've seen the collapse of home builders and those sites were sat empty for months on end and it was this council and residents that were left waiting for, for, for these homes that we were so desperately needing. In response to that, we then had the report come forward, which this authority supported, which will, in my view, make it harder to build homes here. It was a net zero plan, which in my view will make it more expensive and harder to build homes here, making it harder for us to get the homes built for for those hundreds of people and families that are sat on our housing register list. We've also been bounced by the Welsh Assembly, Welsh Labour into spending millions of pounds on electric trucks when we have pressures in in ed, in education and social services. I for one would have preferred to spend that money there than on electric vehicles, but we were bounced by that because of the grants that uh, Welsh Labour ha handed out. And I think it really is uh, shocking that we have Welsh Labour members in the administration and even they aren't even able to get Cardiff Bay to listen to give us the money we need to get the funds we need to to no councillor chris it doesn't but the welsh okay children that 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 is simply not true the, the welsh that? government gets its budget and can spend Stout, please thank you sorry tom thank you chair the welsh government gets its money from westminster but it can spend it how it likes it has chosen to spend money on more members of the senate down in cardiff bay it has chosen to spend money on a speed limit at costs of hundreds of millions of pounds that money could have come here it could have come to local government they have I made a political the choice is it going to be a question to... or is it just going to be a rambling statement for half an hour Excuse me, Tom. Tom, would you like to finish your point, please? Yes, I will come to a close. Thank you. Um, I I don't feel like I can support this because there are so many grey zones still still hanging over the yeah. budget here, many of which we have spoke about here in the chamber. I am hopeful from the debate that we've had that there are plans forward that we won't be back in this re this reoccurring nightmare next year, or we'll be in a better place but currently with what is in front of me right now i don't feel like i can support this budget thank you thank you councillor tom councillor Gronley. thank you chairman i've been listening here quite patiently to what i believe is quite in uh, inappropriate comments by some of the members quite disingenuous comments that we council that we're plucking figures from the air from one of one of the members now, Amanda made it clear at the start of this year the, situ the situ situation we faced as far as the, the budgets and the fact that we had the lowest set settlement in Wales, along with Gwynedd, has only made that sort of situation far worse. We were all told as cabinet members that we'd be facing somewhere in the region of 10% savings and we all went away and tried to deliver those. Some of us have achieved that, some have achieved more than that, but at a, at a se severe cost to our ratepayers in the way the services will be curtailed. Now, to say that education has had a, an unfair cut is not appropriate. Education is having to look at its finances like all other services and come to a balanced position. Now, the fact that secondary schools are having somewhere in the region of £200 per pupil more than the national average must mean that they are getting a decent amount of money. Now, I think there will be some redundancies. The question to be asked is, are there too many teachers in some schools? Is the pupil-teacher ratio wrong? Because obviously, if, we are, if we're having more money than the national average, where is that money going? So there is a time to seriously look at all our services to make sure they are delivering value for money uh, in, in accordance with all the other services. Now, my own service, ERF, is going to have severe cuts in it, 10%, and there will be significant effect on our red pairs. We've had to do that. So to pluck one special uh, service out of the out of all the others and say that they are a special case is totally disingenuous. Now if you've got something uh, better to offer, come forward with it. All I've heard so far is criticism of the way we've arrived at the budget, but no proposals of how we put forward a better budget. So either put up or shut up would be my comment.
Yeah. Guy, have any... Can I ask Councillor Emily, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, before I begin just on the budget, I just wanted to touch um, a little bit um, on all our councillors here today. Um, this is, you know, it's a really difficult situation that we find ourselves in. And I think we all need to commit to zero tolerance to any form of abuse and intimidation. Um, because particularly after the last um, budget setting, I was aware that there were some councillors um, that were too intimidated to go to the shops. Uh, we talk about a lot about abuse and intimidation of MPs and MSs. Um, I don't think we talk about it in councillors and any councillor that's having that level of intimidation. Uh, you know, it's really not good on democracy. And I think that goes across, regardless of politics, put that aside a second. I think we all, as humans, need to be really aware of our comments and make sure that we're not encouraging that um, when it's going on for the sake of democracy. Um, so I'll go on to actual budget now. Obviously, it's been a really, really difficult budget. And we've had a very disappointing settlement from Welsh Government. Um, you know, that's certainly not from lack of effort um, with lobbying it. And we, but we know that funding formulas are really hard to get right. Um, we absolutely need to advocate uh, for what's fairer. But there are always going to be winners and losers in any form um, of formula. Um, so the data is an issue that I have with um, the the formula uh, um, that we've got at the moment. Some of it, some of that data is not clean. It's not up to date. Um, I have had a commitment from both leadership candidates for first minister that that is something that they'll concentrate on when they take office to hopefully put in place before the next year's budget. But we've got the Barnet formula, which we don't think is fair for Wales because it doesn't take into account our elderly population. We've got the Welsh Government funding formula for local authorities, which we in Conway don't think is fair because it doesn't benefit us. But also we have schools and social care last year, social care providers saying that the, the formulas that we set they don't like either. So it is really hard to get that right. But what I would pose to opposition members who will be voting against the budget today is what have they done to try and resolve the funding gap? Um, and, and why are residents struggling? You know, why is the housing crisis getting worse, Tom? Well, it's because of the cost of living crisis, which is a direct impact from the UK government. Um, you know, it, it, there's no, we can't get away from making those links here. Um, there's been very poor attendance from a lot of um, the members that will be voting against the budget today, I must say, apart from Councillor Gareth, um, at the working groups to try and resolve this, to try and be proactive about what we can do for our residents in Conway. You know, my baby's attended some more meetings than some of the councillors in this room to try and balance the budget. Um, you know, make no mistake, this financial situation that we find ourselves in is because of 14 years of choice, which the members opposite are quite right. This is a choice and this is a direct consequence of trickle down austerity. We've, Welsh Government have lost £1.3 billion of their budget, so there is very little wonder why local authorities across Wales are getting less and less. Where were the members opposite with their outcry when Wales is getting no consequentials for HS2? That would have been, Even the scaled-down version of that would have meant £2 billion, pounds, billion pounds for Wales. Just think what Conway Council could have done with their share of that funding. You know, where were members opposite then lobbying their government for that? They weren't. You know, we have no we have no consequentials for the money that um, we've magically found for Northern Ireland recently either. Um, as I've said, the Barnet formula is not based on need, uh, so it doesn't take into account Wales' elderly population. Now, I am prepared to stand here and criticise my party and the Welsh Government for their funding formula. I have done publicly and consistently on that. But the irony of members pointing fingers is a bit flabbergasting, given that their government in Westminster is doing to public services right the way across the UK. If this was a Wales problem, fair enough. It's not. Councils are going pop left, right and centre in England. So but there's no Welsh government to blame there, is there? Um, you know, members opposite have been silent when it comes to challenging their own government and their own party. This budget's not nice and it's not where any of us want to be. I can say hand on heart that myself and Cabinet and all the officers have put everything into finding a solution to these challenges. And I just want to thank everyone involved in trying to find a solution to this. Uh, our aim is for this council to be sustainable for many, many years going forward. So I am pleased at the projects that we've got on the go, a lot of which Charlie has highlighted. But things like bringing our children back to county um, that have been placed outside of county, those uh, the housing projects to deliver things differently, better use of AI technology, coastal defence projects, 4 million additional uh, money that's going back into schools warm hubs continuing in our libraries are all the things that our residents need the most and they're the, the services that we really need to protect 
I believe our staff are our biggest asset and they've all pulled together brilliantly in coming up with it, with this position because the alternative is declaring bankruptcy and registering a 114 with commissioners coming in. So make no mistake, if this budget isn't voted for today, the alternative is to declare bankruptcy because I haven't seen anyone present an alternative budget. So to those who will be voting against the budget, do you honestly think that the commissioners coming in to make decisions for our residents will, will be better for us? Because I certainly don't. All suggestions that have come through FROSC have added to the deficit, meaning we have to bridge that gap for council tax even more than what's already proposed. So we're saying uh, you're saying that we don't want a council tax rise, we don't want cuts, we don't want to be spending reserves, but putting no alternative forward, it's just delusional. Uh, it's easy to sit on the sidelines criticising without putting forward any suggestions, and some of our Senate members are experts at that. But back in the real world, we've got a job to do and we owe it to our residents to get on with that job. Uh, being involved in politics does mean making really difficult decisions and many of those decisions aren't popular, but we always need to do what's right rather than what's easy. So when voting today, uh, please can everyone just keep that in mind and do what's right for our residents to ensure we have sustainable services rather than what's easy to get a quick press headline. Thank you. Nicole. We'll start winding things up now. So I've got Paul and then I've got Cheryl and then Nigel and then David. Okay. And if you can be as brief as you can, please, Paul. Thank you. And sorry, Councillor Hannah as well. I was trying to be disciplined today. Um, well done. <laughs> but. Why change the habit? But. Uh, yeah, we're I'm, warm. Afraid, I'm afraid what Tom said was a step too far. Can I first of all commend what uh, Emily has just said? And can I commend uh, Charlie and Emily during this whole process? The fact is, we've all as councillors on this councillors had the opportunity to get our hands dirty in the fine detail of this budget. Now, I'm not always popular for the challenges I make to and questions I ask of officers, cabinet members, Charlie, but it's a robust process. We argue fiercely, we disagree on things, and we come to a conclusion. And we sometimes have to get our hands really dirty in the decisions we make, and we have to make ourselves um, unpopular. But for Tom, who hasn't been a, a regular participant in those processes, Gareth, to be fair to him, has. He's argued the points, and I share, like Charlie, some of the points he makes, and I've argued some of those points, as Gareth will confirm. The fact is, we've reached this point now. It's a process. There are lots of things in this budget, like everybody else, I'm not happy with. But I will go out to the residents and I will argue the case for each and every one of them because I've been part of those arguments and I've, my mind's been changed on some things, my mind's on other hasn't. But to, to, to stand up and argue that why we're in this position again this year, did he not realise his party had a trust government which put interest rates through the, 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 the roof, who argued, argued publicly we could have tax cuts by borrowing money to pay tax cuts for us all, which everybody knew was a complete nonsense. And then that further screwed up the economy. I mean, where are you in your thinking that Gareth, at least, understands the difficulties of us making these decisions. Transformational change can only take place if we have money to fund those significant changes and how we deliver those things. I've argued, not popular, to make some more cuts to fund some extra reserves to do that work. But I've listened to colleagues, listened carefully to colleagues, and accept at the present time we cannot put those that money into reserves to do that. But today, we must, as Emily says, vote through this budget, because if we don't vote through this budget and people um, 
want a majority to throw this budget out, the commissioners come in and their cuts will be even tougher and they won't have the same representation that we can provide from our residents. So let's stop some of the nonsense that I've heard today and let's get this budget passed. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Cheryl. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, just building a little on what Councillor Emily said. Can I ask that we are all respectful to each other just because some members didn't like what Councillor David had to say, what Councillor Tom had to say. There was absolutely no need whatsoever to stop heckling, shouting, jeering. How can you talk about being kind to each other, being respectful when you, you, when you behaved like that? Um, this is a, a proper debate. We are here to stick up for our residents and that's what we're going to do. And if you don't like it, that's absolutely fine. But please be respectful. Don't do that. It, it, it wasn't nice. We've got new councillors in here. It's really not nice. And you wonder about all the problems that go on in, for MPs and things like that. That should not be in this chamber. We've moved past that. We're here to stick up for our residents, not be in the playground. It's pathetic. Now, can I ask how Labour voted when there were previous administrations in place? You voted against budgets. You absolutely did. We have given you, over the past 12 months, many suggestions and recommendations during finance and resources. They've always been voted down. So I just wanted to make that point very clearly. And now I'll go on to a question for Councillor Charlie, a technical question, page 279. Can you tell us on the additional budget reduction proposal details, 24-25, um, why the... Um, table has changed significantly from the one that was presented to Frost. You've uh, done away with remodel the funding arrangements around school modernisation and also the economy and culture, the um, shared prosperity fund uh, to offset budget costs. Um, I don't see where that's reflected in the figures. Uh, you've completely changed it from what went through Frost the other day and I wondered how you could explain that and what impact it has on the budget. Thank you. Sorry, Sharon, page 27. Two, seven. <clears throat> I'll just bring in Amanda while Charlie's finding that. I'd love you to bring it up. Uh, yeah, perhaps perhaps I can just just clarify. Um, all all of the same proposals are in there. The reason uh, you don't see them on that schedule is because um, I've now uh, effectively reflected them on the relevant schedules. So um, the as you say the the um, so so just just in terms of moving forward the the original. Um, when when all the budget reductions first came to um, finance and resources, there was a complete pack of them. And then when we came to the last finance and resources, uh, that report just told you about the extra ones. So this this report now has all of them back in again. So in terms of those, uh, there were, as you say, there were there were six, weren't there? So there were there were these four that are effectively corporate savings. Uh, there was another one which was 155 additional, if my memory serves me right, to do with um, um, schools. Uh, sorry, to do with um, uh, education, and it was for the for the thing. So what you'll find is on the on the budget reduction proposal sheet that pertains to education um that the figure uh that was uh in the first pack only had um uh, 150k in and it now has 300k in so effectively that education one is is now in the schedule that pertains to education directly uh and i think the other one um as you say was um what was the other one yeah, the shared prosperity. So, so, so again, again on the economy and culture um, budget reduction sheet, um, that has now been increased to reflect that additional hundred k. So, so they are there. It's just that they've been distributed back into the individual service ones, whereas the one in la the last Rosk had a number of services in the same schedule. Deal, Amanda. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Amanda. Sure. Can I um, exercise my right of reply, please? Sorry. 
Tom. Yep. Uh, I was sort of knocked a little off course, or perhaps my message uh, was lost during my uh, speech earlier. So I'd first of all like to uh, respond to Paul and say uh, I I absolutely would not defend Liz Truss or her very brief time in office, Paul, and I'll say that in front of all members now. I am, like Emily has done previously, more than happy to criticise my party and government when it is needed. Councillor Emily, my, 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 my comments were not an attack on you or your colleagues. It was more trying to show how amazing it is and how out of touch Cardiff Bay appears to me that even councillors from their own party, when 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 you're going there speaking to these people to say we need more 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 funding that the message isn't getting through so i i just i just want to put that straight i'm not here attacking any other councillor i'm 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 making the observation that even those with those direct links to the ministers in in cardiff bay the those ministers still aren't listening so i, I felt like the debate all got a bit heated there yeah uh, with thank a couple of members jumping that. up and down, and I wanted to clarify. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm thank you. Response. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Nigel. Dear Kaderis, um, well, I've heard a number of disingenuous comments today. Um, I think our our public are not um, that ill-informed, having seen recently on all the news channels the difficulty that all uh, local authorities are facing throughout the United Kingdom, and and we're no different. Uh, I've heard comments from uh, uh, group leaders claiming um, U-turns have been done by this authority or by the leadership, and I think that's comical, to be honest, because everything was on the table, nothing was off the table. I've heard comments today about the um, education department and yet we had a we had a a fantastic estimate report which highlighted that we we fund our education departments well well above the welsh national average and it's so much that uh, i think it's about 3 and a half million pound above the national average in total per pupil um so this has been a very very long process to get to where we are today and I want to thank those elected members that have took and taken the time to come along and represent their electorate and have their say and, and get us to the position we are in today. But sadly, there is a small number of elected councillors here that are chosen not to represent their elected members and to their elected uh, electorate um, and to have their say and to uh, look out for their, uh, for their electorate. And uh, that's really disappointing when they're just uh, grandstanding here today, having not been involved. And I hope that the public will bear that in mind going forward and uh, choose very carefully who they elect. I, I want to thank the finance team and our senior officers um, because they've made this process um, understandable for all elected members and allowed us to make those very, very difficult decisions. And we know that going forward, things are going to be equally difficult. And I just want to uh, reassure our staff that, and our public that we will do everything we can to uh, keep our council tax as low as possible whilst maintaining the services that we need as an, as an authority um, to provide. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just Chris Can I just welcome... Caleb, who's going to bring some rationalisation to the uh, discussion. It is. David. Thank you, Chair. Just firstly, to actually sort of echo what Councillor Cheryl said, we did did pass the debate, not hate thing. And I think we should all respect each other. You know, everybody's entitled to the view. Every everybody should be listened to, and we should respect that. On what Councillor Emily was saying, you know, 
it was less than two years ago that all the Labour group, including the, the one myself and the one that went over to Plaid, Councillor Cathy, we all stood on a manifesto of keeping council tax low. Right. I don't see how a record uh, council tax increase last year of 10%, another another 10% this year is keeping council tax slow. So I think you should be mindful of that. The council tax hits the poorest hardest. So uh, the other point I wanted to make was that uh, what council, Councillor Nigel was saying, we've seen it all in the news, but in England, in England, they've been limited to less than 5%. In fact, they had a council tax freeze. So, so they've not had the kind of... When, when we look at this council tax, if it goes through today... It's going to be fifty four percent in the last six years increase, you know, and and, and nearly twenty five percent of that, as I said earlier, is is above inflation, real terms increase. So really, we've had the money, and and just one final point, I'm trying to be brief, is about the commissioners coming in. We we have twenty five million pounds in in cash and reserves, and as Amanda said, nine million of that is ready to spend today if we wanted to. Three point five million of that would get that council tax down down. To below five percent is which which I think would be more palatable for, for for our residents, more in line with what inflation is. So the commissioners wouldn't be coming in if we reduce council tax down to five percent, and that's the reason I would ask people not to vote for this budget, but actually to come back again and actually look and use those cash reserves and get that council tax below five percent. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Hannah, and then I'm going to finish with councillor Austin. Okay. Thank you. I think we established earlier when Charlie did a bit of maths for us that if you take the fire services out, that the, counts, the Conservatives have actually set the highest um, past council tax. But moving on from that, I'm a teacher, as many of you know, so up till very recently I was working in one of our local secondary schools. I'm a daughter of teachers, my siblings are teachers, we're married to teachers, Christmas is really boring. I chair education and skills. I'm on the school budget forum and I attended the budget cut meetings or the budget group meetings where we discussed all these. Conway and Wales support education. They always have done and we do it well. In the decades before, after 2010, Westminster did not. Austerity meant that English school budgets were cut by 8 or 9%, but in Wales we managed to protect those and cut them only to 5%. The COVID uplift in England gave £300 per pupil, but Wales gave £800 per pupil. If you take the last 14 years, Wales has spent, increased their funding to education by 3%. That's dire. That's not enough. But England's cut theirs by 1%. So in Wales, we also have flying start for our youngest. We have educational maintenance allowance for our sixth formers. We have... Uh, much better and fairer system for loans to students and for supporting our students at university. The English children don't have that anymore. The funding formula for Wales doesn't work for Conway, but it does prioritise children. We have falling numbers of children. We don't have as many in Conway and those numbers are going down. So that's an extra challenge for our school. So we've done our best to try and protect our schools. Whereas Denbyshire and Flintshire got more money per person last year, we were the ones that gave more money to our students. So we gave more money per pupil last year than they did. It's not just that. We spend it well. Our teachers work miracles. We are the second best ESTIN prof profile in Wales. We've had an excellent ESTIN inspection of our education team here in Conway. We were one of the first authorities to get free school meals out to every primary school pupil. We are sector leading with our SEN, Eskal Gogov. We have invested in new ALN units in Eskal Abba Conway. We've developed our PIPRU positions for pupil that, pupils that are not able to be in the school. We've already heard about how we're trying to get our most vulnerable children that we look after back into county and how we're spending to actually make sure that happens. Our kids get some of the best results and they also have access to an innovative music services that focus on music for all, not elites. We have a skill services that works with any of our kids that are at risk of not being qualified or not going into education. We have a youth service with a gold award for excellence. We are doing a really good job by our kids. Now, I am always 
always going to fight for more. And I recognise there's a real difficulty in a school with a falling role because a class of 30 is going to get more money. They're going to class of 25, but they're still going to cost the same in, in terms of staffing. So Conway has actually, and I want to reassure the parents out there because the news headlines are going to be that we've cut money to schools. What in actual fact we've done is we've actually increased the money to schools by 4.91%. That's more than the rate of inflation. Inflation. In England, the schools that are directly funded by the government have been, there's been a news report in the last week saying that they have equivalent of a 0.5% increase. I'm glad my kids are educated here. So this, I'm angry. I'm really angry about what's happening with schools. And I really understand the head teachers writing to the parents. And I understand the many emails I've had from parents but your anger should not be focused on Conway. Your anger needs to be focused on London, on Westminster, because that's where there is not that care for children. It does not exist there. They're not supporting their own children. And we are trying to support ours with the consequentials of what is spent there. So it's just not sufficient. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Hannah. Alladin. Austin, you're Hello, Austin, Austin to finish, and then Councillor. Uh, uh, the end of is on duty and the Thank you, Chair, but I have decided that it's best to keep quiet sometimes, just in case I have an, uh, a nasty email tonight. Well, we've come to the stage where we have to make the decision. Um, we have a proposal in front of us and we have a seconder to that proposal so i'd like to make this as simple as we can would you like yeah no problem yeah like a mouse or english <laughs> so the recommendation in front of you to 2.1 to approve the resolutions contained within, within Appendix A, having approved the budget set out in Appendix 9, supported by the background report in Appendix 1. 2.2, to approve that any grant transfers into the final settlement are distributed to the relevant service. And 2.3, to approve a contribution to or from general balances should any movement in the final settlement provide more or less resources than the provisional settlement. Sorry. Councillor Chettle, would you like a recorded vote by any chance? I have a sure. recommend. Mind, mind reader today, Anna. Chair. You're fantastic. Yes, please. Okay. So to do that, I need your approval. So I've got to propose on that. Can I have a second there? Councillor Gareth, and could we show hands for a recorded vote, please? Yeah, that's that's enough. That's over. The old okay. members. That's over three quarters. Oh, there you go. Over the figure. Fantastic. So, all those in favour of the proposal? Sorry? Are we, oh, sorry. We're going to do it by paper. Yeah. Then I'm all then. Champion. Okay, so um, for, against, or abstain, I'll call out your names individually. Councillor Penny Andow. Councillor Cathy Augustine. Councillor Carol Beard. Councillor Anthony Batola. Yeah. Councillor Frank Bradfield. Oh. Councillor Chris Broccoli. Oh. Councillor Cheryl Carlisle. Against. Councillor David Carr. Against. Councillor Chris Pater. Four. Councillor Samantha Cotton. Councillor Simon Croft. Oh, but the mic loud, Basley. Yeah. Councillor Sharon Dolman. Councillor Gromwe Edwards. Councillor Gwenol Ellis. 
Councillor Louise Emery. An urban. Councillor Julie Fallon. Councillor Hannah Fleet. Four. Councillor Sean Grady. Four. Councillor Mandy Hawkins. Four. Councillor Chris Hughes. Five. Councillor Alan Hunter. Four. Councillor Dave Jones. Four. Councillor Gail Jones. Four. Councillor Gareth Jones. And there'll be. Councillor Abdul Khan. Obliged. Councillor Tristan Lewis. Obliged. Councillor Ivor Lloyd. Obliged. Councillor Paul Lecock. Oh. Councillor Anne McCaffrey. Against. Councillor Charlie McCoubrey. Obliged. Councillor Benice McLaughlin. Against. Councillor Thomas Montgomery. Against. Councillor Joe Nuttall. Against. Councillor Emily Owen. Councillor Nia Owen. Councillor Stephen Price. Four. Councillor Mike Priestley. Four. Councillor Kay Redhead. Oblige. Councillor Austin Roberts. Oblige. Councillor Dilwyn Roberts. Oblige. Councillor John Roberts. Oblige. Councillor Elizabeth Roberts. Oblige. Councillor Harry Savile. Against. Councillor Susan Schotter. Oblige. Councillor Michael Smith. Four. Councillor Nigel Smith. Oblige. Councillor Jeff Stewart. Councillor Trevor Stott. Oh, could you unmute or could, could you give me a thumbs up if that's in favour? You're on mute, Trevor. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Thumbs up. I yeah. think that's a thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Jacob Williams. On that pin. Councillor Andrew Wood. Good And Councillor Aaron Wynn. Right. Verification. Yeah, I've done it. Okay. The result of the vote 39 4 and 12 against. So the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank for you for. It's been a long and Windy road. We know this. <laughs> the job is here, though, isn't it? Eh? Then I will. I've also been asked to just a point of clarification. The previous vote in item eleven, uh, there was nine against because there was one online. There was eight in the um, chamber and one online, so it was forty-two in favour and nine against. Okay. The whole. Moving on. I'll kick out the ruffians now, and we'll move on to. Item eight in your pack. The baby. Chairman, uh, I have a member of my family who works for the authority. Do I have to declare an interest? Sorry, uh, Grant. I have a member of my family who works for the authority. Do I have to declare an interest? I don't know. My monitor office is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you asking me? <laughs> no. I'll, I'll go I've got Kerry it. here. Don't you worry. Yeah. Please just want to leave. <laughs> Don't panic, Mr. Manring. We have Kerry. He is very capable. No. no. 
Andrew Dean says no. <laughs> but all. I try and all you're coming. I get up. Turn that? back to Welsh again. Back to number eight, item eight, the agenda, pay accountability in local government, pay policy 24-25, including local government pension scheme, discretionary pension statement. I've got councillor Chris Cater taking this, I believe, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, this is before us today as, in, as a, in accordance with the requirements of sections 38 to 43 of the Localism Act 2011, a pay policy statement must be prepared and approved by council for each financial year and published on the relevant website by the 31st of March. Uh, so we have a, a legal duty to be completely transparent. At the date of the publication of this statement, the 2023-2024 pay agreements for the Chief Executive, Chief Officers, Chief, Chief Officers, Pay and Youth and Community Workers had been agreed by the relevant joint negotiating committees. And the allowances for teachers in residential establishments have also been agreed, Chair. Uh, we know that council should have the opportunity to vote on salary packages of more than 100,000. There are currently three chief officer posts that have the potential to attract such salary packages, namely the chief executive and the two strategic directors. The annual pay policy statement, Appendix A, is published on the website along with appendices detailing the pay scales for officers, chief officers, and the chief executive. Pay relati relati relativities are also set out in Appendix A. The multiple between the lowest paid full-time equivalent and the chief executive is a ratio of 1 to 6.07 for our local authority. Uh, legally, uh, 1.20 is the maximum mentioned for the public sector in Section 7.3 of Appendix A. So uh, our figures much below that. All staff grades are assessed through a job evaluation process, which ensures compliance with a league equal pay legislation. We abide by the Equality Act 2010, and we will continue to improve the equality outcomes through our strategic equality plan, which is reported on annually. Members will be aware that our new 2024-2028 plan has just been out for public consultation. As officer pay agreements are nationally negotiated by the relevant negotiation committee, there is no scope for us today to amend the pay policy statement. Most aspects of local pay policy are driven by national pay negotiations, which we are required to adopt locally. Therefore, we have little control or discretion over any changes. However, there are a small number of discretionary elements to the local pay policy, and these are described in Appendix A. These discretions are also set out in other local policies, for example, redundancy and retirement. So this uh, today we have debated the 2024-2025 budget. I want to thank our staff for their dedication and hard work as we aim to ensure value for money for the tax payer, but also provide high standards and quality services. The council is the main employer in the area, and we must be conscious of our role in improving the economic well-being of our residents. So I propose that we, as members, approve the report, the pay policy statement for 2024-2025, the appendices, including the local government pension scheme, discretionary pension statement, and all recommendations to ensure that the council complies with its statutory duties under the Localism Act 2011. Um, Chair, the recommendation is set out on page 12 at 2.4. So I move that. Thank you. Also, have I got a seconder? Have I got a seconder? 
I'll say it again. I've got a proposer. Have we got a seconder, please, to the proposal? Chair, Councillor Michael. Thank you. I've got a seconder. Is there a question or a comment? Yes. Um, can I just clarify more for members of the public? Um, does this pay review include our pay as councillors or is this purely for staff? Thank you. No, it doesn't include our ours is set by the independent panel the remun independent panel for remun remuneration panel for Wales. Wales. Yes. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. No well. Rudash, you got a question? Anybody there? else want to ask a question or comment? No? Okay then, go straight to the votes. Everyone in favour? Anyone against? Sanctions? And that's been carried. Thank you, very Thank you all very much. It really has been a journey to get to this point. <laughs> Thank you and we'll see you next time. Thank you. It needs to